Well, first I want to say thank you, obviously, sir. I mean, I know you're uh, you're very busy. You got a lot of things going on, and I, I can't thank you enough for coming on because when it's just kind of like LA, you're one of those guys that has done a lot for their career field. Like you're you have been integral in its um, advancement to the next level. You you know you did everything you could when you were uh, you know involved with us, and I I I really appreciate you know guys like you who um, it may not have been your you know the path at first when you first started but then you took it and ran with it and you were a champion of our efforts and a real big advocate for us and and not only that frankly after uh reading your bio not only you're an advocate for us but you were like one of us i mean you were down and you were down in the trenches doing the same thing we were doing often and uh, i just want to say thanks a lot for for everything you've done in your career and and coming on and i appreciate it well uh thanks for having me and sure. it's a, it's really an honor and uh I would say that's probably one of the biggest compliments I've gotten is to to be included in the in the um, on the team, you know, in the community, the brotherhood. Uh, that means probably more than anything else, any other kind of accolade I've ever gotten in the, in in or out of the business. So, you know, thanks very much for that. For sure. Yeah, you're well. I know you're well respected in the community. I mean, I've never heard anybody say anything disparaging about you it's always been like positive things and you know uh yeah so you are definitely one of those guys that we all hold in high regard so um thanks a lot for that i appreciate it well thanks. so let's start off with um i don't want to take away from you but you're uh you was read like again i was reading your bio and your father I, was kind of an influence on you in a lot of things and he was just such a fascinating guy i mean he was like um uh, you know, he was, he worked on submarines and he was a pilot and he was a boxing champion and, you know, he did all these things, electrical engineer. Um, maybe talk about how, if you want, maybe we can start off while you're talking about him and his influence and your mother, even I, man, I can't believe I forgot about your mother. She was like a pioneer in you know, women's aviation. And, um, maybe you talk about that, talk about your, your early life and how that formed your, um, desire to, you know, join the military. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and, and actually, uh, other than the, you know, the main topic of, of our community and, and uh, a little bit of history, I, I wouldn't rather talk about anything else than right. uh, my uh, mom and dad. And, and uh, my dad, uh, I think you covered pretty much some of his fascinating aspects of what he did in his life. Um, uh, it also included stock car driving in the uh, in the 60s, which was really something. I remember going to the races when we were little kids. And um, I, it's very rarely captured, like in the movies and stuff. It was a dirt track and people would go and, you know, drink beer, eat hot dogs and watch the races. And, uh, you know, I'm sure everybody was cheering for a crash. <laughs> like <Right>. They do. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, yeah, so uh, it, it was really interesting because because uh, my dad was uh, uh, kind of like everywhere all the time doing different things. And then he just kept evolving and he started his own business. Uh, I worked there in the summers. Um, my brother made it his career um, while the company was still running. And we did some fascinating things there. Uh, he built electrical control panels and uh, we'd install them in downtown Manhattan. Uh, I'm from New Jersey. So a lot of our work was done there in New Jersey. And then we'd cross over the river and then go into Manhattan to fix where they had the, the big brown out. I can't remember what year it was, but, uh, mm. so that was, that was impressive. Uh, he drove the first electric, uh, vehicle, um, from New Jersey to, um, Washington DC. It was, he worked for a company called Galton industries and, uh, he was kind of an engineer. He, he had no education, um, per se, and he just, tinkered and learned and he learned his mechanics and uh, the Navy on submarines. So he was in the Korean War, but he also really liked to, to refer back to uh, the Cold War era with the uh, kind of going uh, head to head with the Russian submarines. And uh, later on, when he saw like um, hunting for Red October or hunt for Red October, um, he could relate to some of the lingo and stuff like that, which was pretty cool. Yeah, so, yeah. um, and I, I really, and my mom, you know, like you said, I mean, it was, uh, she was totally under recognized or appreciated for being so, and she was so quiet, you know, just didn't do, didn't do anything for, for the praise. It was always like, that's what she wanted to do. And, uh, 
Um, she started flying when she was in her teens, uh, late teens, 20s. And uh, she that's where her and my dad met was at the airport. <laughs> so when it came down to, um, you know, joining the military, um, my first thought was to fly. And it was because of them. Sure. And I'd flown in, in open cockpit propeller airplanes since I was a little kid. And, uh, you know, so that was fascinating to me. Uh, and then I can't leave out um, my mom's brother, uh, my uncle Pete, who I'm named after. Uh, and actually, here's a, here's a picture of him. Oh, okay, yeah cover of the this is the book that you and I were talking about but yep. uh he was uh quite a guy too he was born in the early 1900s um our grandfather was um born in the late 1800s like 1879 and he fought in World War 1 wow. and he was wounded in the second battle of the Marne and spent the rest of his days in and out of the VA hospital uh, it was a really a sad story. And, uh, so my uncle raised the family. They had, um, um, eight, they had, I think they had 10 kids, five lived, uh, oh, to, to adulthood. And my grandmother had a little shop and, um, she was almost beaten to death once being robbed. So my uncle had to step Jeez. in and be the dad. And he, he was a professional boxer. Okay. So the and we never knew any of this. And right. he he had some quite quite some heroics in World War II. He was with Patton. And I'll tell you that in a second, but so we never knew any of this stuff. And so we're kids and I think my dad bought us uh, cuz he was a boxer and he would teach us how to box and so he bought us a speed bag and my uncle comes home one day and he's a you know bald old dude and he yeah. just walks up to the uh to the bag and it's you know like dun, 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 dun. and then all of a sudden he just starts tearing this thing you know using his elbows yeah, and yeah. stuff and we're like wow where'd that come from and then one day he told us uh, this story that is in that book um and this all all of it and especially my my uh uncle's story is why uh we came out with that there i was just like you're doing right now is to capture stories uh for forever because right. we all know you know if I, I get hit by a bus all the stuff that's going on in here is gone forever gone. um yep. yeah so and those guys and like your uncle guys like your uncle and your grandfather and my grandfather and and uh and i was talking to kenny Lindsay, his great his grandfather they they are very unassuming and they they're they don't they're not seeking any recognition so you almost have to like pull those stories out of those guys or like hey make them feel comfortable you know talking about it and it's it, once they and it's so amazing the things they have to say. You know what I mean? It's like my grandfather used to, you know, he'd he uh, after a while he would start telling me stories about him and you know being in the Philippines during World War II. And it's just amazing stuff that these guys just said. Well, yeah, that's we were that was our job. We were supposed to do that. You know, there's no fanfare or anything. So yeah, they're just ama an amazing generation for sure. Yeah, and you know, I used to think, uh, especially you know, we all f fought in um, you know for 20 years in, in America's latest war. And, um, you know, once in a while you think back to, to the heroics of our, uh, forefathers and, and, uh, you, you know, then you start thinking, man, we, we just, you know, they talk about the greatest generation and stuff, but then, you know, we, we have stuff that guys, guys that you've interviewed have done and, yeah. you know, you cannot say that we don't have the same grit and the courage and, uh, the, uh, you know, I'll speak for America right now, but the American military ingenuity that they did sure. were the same, were the same DNA, you know, yep. I think society's different, but when it comes down to it, servicemen, the, those who, you know, especially those who volunteer, um, you know, and it's not necessarily because they volunteer, but, um, you know, we, we got it. It's yeah. in, it's on so the it's caliber, us too. the caliber of man that goes to, that goes to war for sure. Yep. Yep. And I just want to just highlight his story real quick. And, and, uh, uh, he, he was, uh, he, he was a mortar squad, uh, or more, I think it's mortar squad lead. He, he was a Sergeant. Okay. Uh, so he was armed with a Thompson and a, uh, 45 and he had a crew and, uh, they were, um, 
advancing with patent and as was the case that they bypassed a lot of German units uh, with the goal of, you know, striking the death blow to, to Germany. Right. So they passed a uh, battalion of Germans. They knew it and they were worried that uh, they were going to get outflanked or uh, attacked from the rear. So um, he was told to take his squad and uh, kind of provide a screen and just watch the back, you know, while they advanced uh for for a day, you know, like it was daytime, it was going to be night. They just wanted to make sure nothing was going to happen. Sure. So he decided that he didn't want his guys. He thought this was a this was a probably a suicide mission. So he told the other guys to go, and it was him by himself. And um, he told so, so again. We wow. don't know anything about this. One day yeah. after I joined the military, I think I've been in a while. And I don't know, maybe he felt like he's coming towards the end of his life or something. And he just started sharing this story. And we're sitting there, we're on the porch, smoking cigars, drinking beer. And nobody ever heard the story before. And he tells it and, on a, you know, not to get any fanfare or anything, but yeah, yeah. It, it was such a great story. So he spent the afternoon, uh, he had a 30 caliber machine gun. That was the other thing he had. And uh, so on the... Um, the ring, I'm not, I'm not using the right terminology. I'm not a machine gun guy, but, right. uh, uh, there were, um, like on the reticle, there were, um, gradations, you know, so you could click it, you know? Sure. And, and so he looked at the, the approaching area and anywhere he thought, uh, Germans would hide or approach from, uh, he wrote it in a little notebook. Yeah. So he would aim and then he clicked off a round or two and then, He'd write it down and he goes, okay, you know, like fallen log. And then he would aim and make sure he could uh, zero in on it. And he did that all afternoon. And then he just waited and then it got dark and he just sat there. And sure enough, he hears uh, a lot of clinking and clanking of approaching infantry. And then he very uh, judiciously used the 30 caliber with very short bursts. He didn't, you know, cause you don't want to bring a lot of attention. Like, Hey, sure. there's the machine gun. Right, Let's right. put all the heavy stuff on it. So, and then he kept moving around. He had a couple of, of hide spots and he put the Thompson one place and he was throwing grenades and, and I, I'll, I'll, I'll keep this PG, but he had to go <laughs> to the bathroom. So, <laughs> only, so he used a sock and at one point he threw uh, the sock and the Germans <laughs> thought it was a grenade. So they were like, Granada, Granada. And he just, you know, he cracked up at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, what do you, to keep your sense of humor in that situation is great. Oh, I yeah. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> and it was just like, that's the last he ever said about it. And then, you know, we all moved on. And then thankfully, you know, we, we heard that story and I remembered it uh, because later in life, a few years later, uh, like, unfortunately, like a lot of, uh, older folks, you know, you, you lose your faculties, you forget everything. And, yeah. and he had written everything down and he just got, kind of got bitter at the end and he threw everything in a barrel and burned it. And, oh no. Yeah. What a loss. Right. So that event right there, the fact that he bury or burned all of those stories and the records and his thoughts um, was why we started this series of uh, there I was because everybody doesn't have a book in them but but everybody's got a story so Definitely. and the idea would be to capture and it doesn't all have to be you know buried up to your knees and spent shell casings and hand grenade pins it's the veteran experience you know right. serving because there's a lot of really fascinating stories that don't include um you know, close combat. Um, sure. So that's, that's the purpose of that. And so my, my mom, my dad, and my uncle were what really got me interested in service. Um, I had a great life. Um, it was kind of classic. If uh, I, I'm trying to think of a movie that you could compare it to, uh, not without strife, of course, everybody's got yeah. that, but, um, you know, I had great parents that, that loved me that, that, uh, thankfully they lived to old age. Um, and my, my uncle was like another father and we pl went, played baseball. 
Sandlot baseball, Sandlot football. I played football through little league, high school, college, you know, just lots of fun stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, no, no, we weren't affluent by any means. You know, we were, we were just like everybody else eating, uh, peanut butter sandwiches, uh, mostly because that's my dad worked these, these kind of unusual jobs and my mom was raising us and stuff. Sure. Um, but when it came time, uh, I made a decision. I, I had gone to college for electrical engineering and I was going to get a, they call it a three, two degree you get. Uh, so I got physics, a physics degree first, and I got that in three years. Then I was going to go to university of Pennsylvania, get a, um, engineering degree. Well, I was playing football. It was my senior year and I, I already uh, finished my uh, physics degree. So I wanted to play my senior year. And during that period of time, I decided that uh, the way to pay back the country, my family uh, was to serve. So sure. uh, my parents uh, background with the aviation wanted to fly. Yeah. So uh, it was interesting. Like, I'm sure we all have... <laughs> recruiter stories, yeah, yeah, yeah. but, uh, you, you know, it's what they need is what, what, uh, you're best at, you know, right, you know, right. like you would be a yeah, exactly. great weatherman. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm like, nah, I don't think so. Nothing wrong with weathermen, but uh, sure, sure. Yeah. And, uh, so I, I, um, I, I went to all the recruiters. I went to the Marines. They said, you, you need to sign up, be an infantryman first, uh, still wanting to fly. I said, okay. Uh, Navy, they wanted me to be a um, nuclear engineer since I was a physics major on the carrier. I was like, nah. And then um, uh, the Army said, you're going to, you'd be great, uh, be a helicopter pilot, be a warrant officer, you know, and I thought about that. And then when the Air Force came around, um, I, I, they said, Dad, you know, we really need weather guys. They didn't, sorry, they didn't say we really need weather guys. They said, You'd be really great with your technical background to be a weather guy. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, no, nah, I don't want to do that. I want to fly. Right. So um, it turns out I have this like really stupid eye thing um, uh, that they said, oh, you're going to need glasses uh, later in life. Well, so who doesn't? <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. Yeah, we're all, you know, so yeah. I, I wasn't um, pilot qualified. So I became a navigator. And, okay. Um, so I went to nav school and, and um, um, it was during Cold War. So early 80s, and everybody got a P-52 or a KC-135 tanker. And those were a, what we needed at that time to deter the red threat or whatever right, they were saying at the right. time. Yeah. yeah. So I would consider, I call that my, uh, my first career. I, I think within my 30 years and, and, and I really do feel like I'm still serving now because I advocate in my job for TACP and, um, you know, this is not braggadocious by any means. I, I'm just was lucky enough as you'll hear, uh, to be guided by, some giants in the career field and given opportunities and sometimes unprepared for them All right. uh, to either succeed or fail. And, and luckily I succeeded, but I've had some unique experiences that, that uh, others don't have the opportunity to have today because of the nature of uh, the current warfare and the state of things. And we, yep. we all were blessed. I think I'll, I'll say that word to have served in the window from 2001 to like 2011 sure. where they needed us and we got the attention that that was denied for years and you know the air force didn't like us the army didn't know what we really were for right. um you know that kind of thing but yeah we were all lucky in that window oh for sure for sure yeah it was a very unique time where it all kind of came together a lot of guys are talking about that how it was just a kind of that that natural mix of all the cogs kind of fit into place and yeah it was, it was pretty fortunate for us that's why i'm kind of like i mean i don't want to get on a soapbox but it's kind of like now they're starting to get away from it again and i'm like i mean for those of us who've been in a long time we've seen this pendulum swing and i'm just like okay i get you we need to innovate and we need to go forward and go towards the future but we can't forget about the past either otherwise we're just going to be play catch up like we did back in 01 so yeah. No, and it's it's uh, that is the DNA of the community is in um, 
you know, it, it's funny because folks will say, you know, we're going to shift to support the CFAC, so support the Air Force. And it's like, that's what we do. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Always that's all we do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In supporting, in direct support of the Army is supporting the Air Force. And, and the idea that, that, as you well know, especially with your background in, in soft, is it's the main thing is anti, anti fratricide. Sure. you know, fratricide prevention, then it's precision. And then it's joint integration of fires. And uh, that's what I think we really need to hang our hat on is the fact that that uh, that's what we do for the DOD. No other service gives 3000 dudes that are dedicated to joint integration, right? You know, we serve with other services, you know, we get a glow you know, from yeah. the army. one dude per one dude per, you know, wing or headquarters yeah. or whatever. And, and we're, we're putting squadrons and groups and wings, you know, up to the mission and to turn our backs on that is, you know, we have all of that because it's necessary because sure. of the size of who we support and the nature of warfare and everything. So, and yeah, yeah there's, you know, I, I, I understand the, that, like, just, you just said it right. I mean, or you said it, um, probably better than I could, but the fact that they want to evolve, they want to be new and shiny and, you know, something evolving into, um, higher technology utilization, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, um, that, that's very, that becomes very unique and, mm -hmm. uh, very, and a very exquisite solution to a very specific problem right. instead of, you know, army air force, we got to work together. That's what we do. Right, right. So, okay, so you were you started flying B-52s, or I mean, excuse me, navigating B-52s, um, and you had a, you kind of in a unique position when you first came in, you were at uh, Fairchild? Uh, Fairchild, yep. You went to Fairchild first, and you were there for a while because of the, the PCS freeze, like they weren't moving people very much. Um, and you sent that, man, that reminder of, who, who was, you said you knew the guy that was in that crash, that B-52 crash that happened. Um, go ahead, talk about that a little bit, because I remember when that happened, it was just very, like, it was very alarming to see something like that. But you knew the, the, the gentleman that was flying at the time? Oh, yeah. Um, so I'm going to I'm gonna f fill that out for you, but then I'm going to go back and talk a little bit about the uh, uh, nature of uh, combat back then, because it's relevant today with the Cold War with the Russians, Chinese. For sure, for sure. Or, so, uh, yeah, the... A thing I always want to really emphasize to folks, um, and and in my career I've been asked to talk about this when I uh, my next assignment after uh, Fairchild was the Air Force Academy as a um, they call it Air Officer Commanding. You're kind of like the officer that runs all the cadets in the squadron. You oversee them, mentor them, and everything. But so there they asked me to speak about it, but there are no. Um, there, there were no real demons in, in this story. Uh, there were mistakes made and um, there were bad, bad decisions, but there were no, you know, that they try to demonize that the pilot was um, um, Bud Holland and uh, he was a great guy. So he was my pilot. So okay. as a, in a crew, and we were on that what they call SO1. So that's the number one crew. That's the stand of our crew. So you have SO1, 2, and 3. And SO1 is the lead crew of basically the, the whole wing. Mm -hmm. And he was the pilot. And then I was the radar, which is the bombardier. And, uh, you know, we had other folks on the crew. And so we would go out and um, he would test the limits of the aircraft uh, he would bend regulations for sure. Um, sometimes we as a crew did some things and he got blamed for it later, you know, because they wanted to, they needed a villain, um, yeah. you know, but uh, the uh, now there no, maybe no per se villains, but I would say there was uh, absolutely a hero in there. And that was the co-pilot who was the squadron commander and that that was um, Lieutenant Colonel Mark McGeehan. And okay. so 325th Bomb Squadron, and then you had the 92nd Bomb Wing. And so he was a squadron commander. And when he saw that that Bud was flying and uh, kind of pushing the envelope or, 
going beyond the envelope and some of the crew actually kind of started emulating them and got into some hairy situations it really got his attention and he did what he thought was the right thing and and he went to the uh, the wing do and told him to ground him mm -hmm. and the do said no i'm not grounding him uh that's not your call well of course it wasn't that's why he went to him to ask him. right yeah yeah he's asking and uh so he said okay then nobody else flies with him but me and uh so he wouldn't let any of the younger pilots fly and he was very experienced he, and what a great guy i mean he yeah. every time you saw the guy he had a big smile on his face laughing wonderful family i got to know his kids and you know once in a while i still make contact with them but uh mm -hmm. so he put himself in that position to uh not let anyone fly with him so he went down with the plane uh what the final moments nobody will ever know uh what what actually happened but the conjecture is that uh bud was flying and w with the b-52 it's um great aircraft but yeah. you know it's old older technology so if you're running out of gas, not, not like you're going to flame out, but if you're low on fuel, the, the thought was that the uh, fuel pumps sit in the bottom of the fuel tank. So if you're flying coordinated, meaning you're pulling a 1G turn, everything's fine because the gas is getting pushed against the, the bottom of the tanks. You never have a problem. But right. if you go uncoordinated, so if you, if you turn it sideways and you're not pulling the amount of Gs, then the fuel is going to fall away from the fuel pump and cavitate. So oh, that okay. you can see in the film, there's like these, the smoke trails quit. So it looks like the engines quit and then they nosed over and crashed and nobody oh, had a chance to that, get yeah. out. So before then, um, then my window there, right before I got there, uh, they crashed a B-52. Uh, and, and this is the part I want to, just touch on briefly um sure. is during the cold war our tactic was to attack individually across so you'd launch at the time the heyday of b-52s we had 700 of them um today we have less than 100 we had 10 bases <clears throat> and uh, uh we would launch uh with tankers so we'd we'd fly out to air refueling point and the tanker would refuel us. So the fascinating thing about B-52, empty, it weighs 186,000 pounds. With weapons and fuel, it weighs 540,000 pounds. <laughs> so it's like, how does that work? Yeah, how's it even <laughs> up there? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you get fueled up and you're, so you're ready to go. And you, you go to a place, it's called the pick tap, the positive control turnaround point. So yeah. you're, you're, you launch and now you're holding at this point. And for us, it was like over the, the, uh, North Pacific or Alaska. Cause we were coming from Fairchild. So we're going over the top of the earth and then we were coming down and, and attacking, um, the Kamchatka peninsula and then other points. So anyway, uh, um, it was just like an amazing aircraft that you, you would be able to do that. And, um, the uh we were pulled alert so you would like uh every third week so one out of three weeks you were what it, the equivalent of maximum security prison right. um, <laughs> you had to stay behind all this barbed bar wire because you were loaded with nukes sure, and sure. one b52 uh in our configuration we had h models uh we had uh 24 nukes which at the time was the um third <laughs> <laughs> most powerful nation on earth wow. because we had United States, Russia. I no, that's, that's an exaggeration because you had China in there. They had, they had nukes too. But then after yeah. that, it was like one B 52. Right. And, uh, we had, uh, six, um, 12, no, wait, we had, uh, cruise missiles on the wings. We had, um, short range attack missiles. We had eight of those. Then we had four. Yeah. We had 12 and 12. We had 12, uh, uh, cruise missiles. So you get to the positive control turnaround point, then you get the code. So you break these, they call them the cookies and you open yeah. it up and there's code in there. 
And then if the mat, they match, then you, you open up all the locks and, and then you load up all of the, the machines that tell the nukes it's time to go and we're going to go hot. So, uh, and then what you do is you, you, you leave the tanker and then you launch your cruise missiles. So you're now they have you loaded with, um, more missiles and gravities. They got, uh, 12 missiles coming at them yeah. and that's times each aircraft. So the missiles were designed to take out the fighter bases and, and, uh, surface to air sites. And then we'd come in with short range attack missiles. So, and uh, this is a long way around to get to the point. Our, our mission was low level. Uh, so okay. we would dive down and we would hit the deck and, uh, come in and the short range attack missiles were for targets of opportunity, believe it or not, for a nuke. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <okay. laughs> you know, so if you came across the, um, SAM site or a, um, um, fighter base or something like that, you could, I, I could, as the bombardier, I could aim at it and, and launch okay. a missile and you shoot it over your shoulder and blow it up. And then you come in with That's the awesome. crowd pleasers, the, the four, uh, big gravity weapons. And those were for, uh, command and control centers, um, cities, you know, whatever. Uh, yeah, yeah. and then when you were done, um, I, Oh, <laughs> it's a great story. And I use this in my retirement. So one of the tools I had in my, uh, little box, there was a little box next to my seat and you open it up and there's this, uh, eye patch. And the idea of the eye patch is that you put the eye patch on and then, they're, the nukes are going to be going off. So the other eye is going to melt out of your head. And oh then God. you're going to take your eye patch <laughs> off and put it on the other side so that you can use the one good eye to aim at the, at the final oh target. Oh, God. Yeah. And you weren't going <laughs> home either because home yeah, was, that, yeah. you know, you were going to ditch or you were going to recover in a in a Asian country or something like that. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because I've heard that it's pretty much one way, one way or the other. You know, either you get shot down or you land somewhere else or you ditch it or something. But yeah, so so they were planning on your eye getting melted out of your head and they had provisions yeah. for that. Yeah. <laughs> I'd be like, can't you come up with something else like to make me not lose an eye? You know, is there any way I could do that? Maybe hit some sunglasses or I don't know what, what you can <laughs> well, do. But, you, know. you know, you're right. That's what they had upstairs. And uh, oh, okay. the pilots had this these things. Fascinating. I, I've never heard it uh, referenced again, but uh, so you're, uh, you had your helmet and then you had your face shield come down and the, they called it plitz goggles. I don't know what it stands for, but okay. it was coated with gold and you could see through it, but it could shut down faster than your eye could blink okay so if a nuke went off then it would shade the the uh eyes of the pilots they didn't care about the guys i was gonna say what about the navigator what about the bombardier yeah, <laughs> yeah so it was uh i i just think it's an untold story and they, they call oh, it's it fascinating the, uh, yeah because you were you're you, here talk about planning right so you had yeah. uh they called it the triad so you right, had right. the bombers the um missiles the silos and the submarines mm -hmm. everything was orchestrated and deconflicted so you had when you were going to launch all this stuff you had uh to be within you know five seconds plus sure. or minus oh man otherwise you could be fratting somebody with your nukes that's why you know the the whole target of opportunity thing was kind of crazy because yeah yeah you didn't know who else was around, but yeah. How do you um, deconflict that with, you, know, yeah. you don't run that up to the chaos or AOC or anything. You know? Yeah. Hey too, uh, this is lead. Close <laughs> <Yeah>. your eyes. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> yeah. But I'm glad we, you know, it, it's like I said, it's the, it's just a fascinating idea that that was a thing Yeah. that, that we had this plan and that was the uh, plan. Yeah. It's yeah, not it like a plan. plan. It was like, that's how you're going to do it. Yeah. 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 That's crazy. Well, I guess the allies were in there too. And, you know, we had, that was us going against like, uh, mainland Russia. Um, uh, when I first got there, we were poised against, uh, Chinese and, and, uh, I can't imagine what it looked like in Europe. A lot of the fighter guys later on, uh, some of the older ALOs talk about, you know, uh, A-10s recovering on, uh, 
you know, highways and stuff. And, right, right. and then the F 16s with like, they had like one nuke <laughs> <They'd> go over, <laughs> lob it in, uh, across the border and then run. You know? That seems even less feasible than what you were doing. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. yeah. What are they doing? But I loved, oh. I loved Fairchild. I loved all the people. They were great. It was, you know, my first assignment in the air force and I love the Pacific Northwest. Um, uh, the mission. Yeah, you're over there in Spokane, so you're not like you're kind of on the more of the in the eastern side of the state, and yeah, that's a nice area there. Beautiful, yeah, beautiful. Yeah. If uh, if I had you know the opportunity, I certainly would have went back. But uh, sure. um, yeah, love that uh, very much, and and I think I learned a lot, and and uh, that goes to kind of current um, uh, current state of affairs is as one of the silverback gorillas trying to tell some of the young guys, uh, the one thing, this is fascinating too, uh, all those missions, when we taxied, you'd, you'd Roger the tower and you're taken off like in, in like quick, they call it a mito minimum interval takeoff. And you'd launch all the bombers as fast as you could, all the tankers as fast as you could. And that's the last, transmission you ever made that's the last time you keyed the mic because <clears throat> they could the russians can uh df you they could you know you're going to tell them where you are sure, so sure. you know so the whole idea was to uh go silent so wow. we're trying to tell some of the young guys like you have to plan to be denied nav aids uh not real relevant for tac p but um radios you, you know yeah. and and that happened to us when i when i was leading in uh iraq uh the the insurgents figured out how to jam uhf satcom our primary jarn you know so so yeah, we yeah. had to stand up uh, hf net and a lot of the guys had kind of forgotten how to do you know expedient antennas and all that yeah. kind of stuff and and if some you know some one of the old chiefs comes out <laughs> and says, okay get out of the way let me show you how to do this you know getting out a plastic spoon and some copper wire and probably <laughs> yeah. running up a fuel expedient exactly yeah 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 we were just referring that the other day when i was at work and we were talking about how um the the comm piece is so we have come full circle to where nobody wants to be you know detected anymore i mean if you in the in the current fight if you are broadcasting chances are you're just going to be dead quickly and you know they're going to find that find you and take you out so yeah the that the comm piece has always been a, a tricky thing uh okay so you um so when you left fairchild you went to academy yeah you went to the academy right so yeah. how was that that seemed like a, a unique uh, position yeah I, I didn't go to the academy i was a uh, um 90 day wonder you know went to i got my college degree uh drank and caroused like you're supposed to in college and then right, uh, right. <laughs> uh, did 90 days learned how to salute and um uh join the air force uh going to the academy was fascinating though because um i i loved the cadets they they were all great american mostly there were some yeah. exceptions sure sure you know but uh it was really fun to to uh, go from being on a crew um that your mission is to uh, turn the, you know, crust the earth into lava um, right. to trying to mentor young folks that are still developing, maturing. And it, man, it was challenging because yeah. you, you can't turn off like hormones and, and uh, normal kid stuff, you know, sure. like you're a teenager. Um, so uh, there was a lot of problems, but it was also very rewarding. I'll tell you what. One one time I was trying to, you know, be a, a good mentor, but maybe this was probably not the best thing to do. But I I was trying to teach the 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 ones who could drink um, right. how to drink responsibly. So sure. I, I had a, a nice uh, place I bought. It was ugh, man, I couldn't buy the mailbox for what I sold that place for. But I had five and a half acres in Monument, Colorado with a barn. So the cadets came over and they fixed it up for a party and we had a big party, got a keg and everything. And again, only the kids who were allowed to drink, it was totally legal and everything, um, drank, but it looked like, uh, the, 
the Gettysburg battlefield the next day, <laughs> her body's lying everywhere and <laughs> just trying to go, okay, no, that's what you don't do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? But it was, it's a, fun. you gave them that opportunity and they took it. Yeah. They're like, oh man, it's a safe place. They probably just felt real comfortable and. Oh yeah. Tore it yeah. Up. They, they, I think they trusted me and, and, uh, the squadron commander. So each cadet, uh, squadron, you know, there's a squadron commander. Yeah. He actually, uh, this, uh, there was a deck up on the second floor. He fell off of the deck oh God. down to the uh, dirt and just plop. And <laughs> was everybody he good? Was just he all right? froze. And I'm like, ah, there goes <laughs> there goes a career. <laughs> and uh, they go running downstairs and they pick him up. And they carry him all the way up. We were we were playing poker upstairs, uh -huh. and they put him down next to the poker table. And he's unconscious, and I'm thinking like, oh boy, that was probably not. The thing to do. Did I get a pulse? It's like this yeah, guy's still alive. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> any broken bones? Right. He's absolutely uninjured, and oh, the guy God. made general. He he he's nice. like a two star general today. <laughs> and I think he said he he wrote me a note one time. He said uh, that that was part of his. Uh, maturing process you know whatever you gave me some accolades <laughs> yeah, for yeah. that but uh um, it's a pretty good lesson yeah. yeah 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 it's a good lesson to learn yeah so i enjoyed uh, that part of it uh my boss a uh, nice person but uh she she was not great at writing oprs yeah. uh she wanted to be creative <laughs> so you don't be creative on oprs you know like, don't try no. new styles you know don't no, no, don't no. say hey watch this i'm going to Put one line in here and leave the rest of it blank, and that's going to really be. <laughs> I've impressive. never heard that before. Yeah, <laughs> oh, never, yeah, that's not a good technique. No, not a good thing. So then uh, I I left there and went to um, uh, Langley, um, okay, Air Force Base, and uh, yeah, yeah. so I I worked a, a rough job, but it was in interesting because this is where I think I'd start tying into uh, uh, later with uh, Tac P and and. Uh, uh, General Longoria in particular, but <clears throat> one of my jobs was to build the uh, contingency response group for ACC. General Jumper, who was the USAFE commander, came to be the uh, COMAC, and he wanted that capability, which they had over there. So it was a lesson to me on how to do a um, like a working group or a tiger team or something. And it's what we didn't do when we started looking at um, the TACP cuts recently, we, mm -hmm. we had a room full of operators and all the operators think like operators and sure. we didn't have logisticians, personnel, finance. Th those are the people we needed in the room to yeah. go, Oh, wait a minute, you got this option or you can do this or something like that. But that's what I, I, so I kind of learned a lot about the bigger, bigger air force. And then, um, I worked the CAT, which is a contingency action team at ACC, which is, you know, basically their command post and mm -hmm. uh, not the base command post where you launch aircraft and stuff, but this is like force provider. Um, so I wrote orders and I dispersed units and things like that. And uh, it was during Kosovo and um, there was a general, who's the guy who ran, for, army guy ran for president and he was passing donuts out on the street corner. This is like in the nineties. Um, oh, I don't uh, remember. Yeah. He was, he, he kind of reminds me of general Petraeus, but a uh, predecessor, very famous Clark, maybe might've been. Yeah. I don't that. I mean, yeah, he was one of those guys. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And, uh, okay. so anyway, uh, they wanted to do a B B one strike. So B at the time B one had not, um, engaged in combat yet. Okay. So, uh, that, fell to me to organize the the timing and put the orders out and everything. So the, they had to get crew rest. So they yeah. flew over there. They stopped in England. So they were 24 hours out of the cycle of that they wanted them there. So, okay. of course, that's my fault. <laughs> yeah, so of the, course. So the two-star right. gets on, a, on the phone and calls our two-star, which is the ACC A3 these days. And, you know, I get lambasted and, and um, you know, anyway. So um, that coupled with my um, my stellar OPRs from the Air Force <laughs> Academy did not help. 
So yeah. I figured, you know, it's time to go do something fun. And right. uh, I had tried to join uh, TACP when I was a captain, but navigators were not eligible. You had to okay. be a pilot. Um, sure, sure. So uh, now they opened it up. And so I went to uh, Fort Drum. And nice. that was my uh, first foray. And, and that was before 9-11. Um, and I think, uh, you know, that talk about destiny, it, it was uh, a yeah. choice I made because I'm from New Jersey, close to my folks. I love my Oh, yeah, my yeah. Family. So I figured, eh, you know, of all the bases and stuff, I'll take that one, you know. So I went yeah. up there and, you know, I won't say the rest is history because I know that's kind of what you want to hear about. <laughs> yeah, please. <do. laughs> the end, yeah. No, but you going there was the, the catalyst for your, I mean, just a, an awesome career for you. I mean, not that you didn't have one before, but man, I mean, once you, just that decision to get close to family was well, the, probably the best decision, not only for yourself, but for us too. I mean, just for us having you come into the community. I mean, that was, I thought that was awesome. I want a, a little perspective here. Where were you at this time? At, uh, when, when was that? 2000? I got to, I was still at Benning. I got to Benning in 97. So yeah, so I was, you was with, uh, the 15th or 17th? 17th. 17th. I guess we were all the 17th at that time. I was with the Rangers and then they had the, um, the third ID guys that were there with us in the same building. But yeah. What year did they do the uh, 17th thing? I don't remember. Uh, I remember when it happened. I just don't remember. I don't remember. I don't, you know, I, I, I should know all these things, but I have no idea. I don't, I don't remember when it went to the 17th. I don't remember when we split from the, when it went from the 17th and then they were debt one 15th ASOS. I don't remember when that split was, but it was, I want to say it was after Iraq. Cause I think, cause yeah. there's a, a bunch of guys on here that were, that deployed, that were still kind of, they were. They were at they were A flight at the time. We were B flight of the seventeenth, and then um, and then so A flight was deploying with third ID to Iraq and all that stuff. So I'm not sure when we actually split it off, but yeah, my, but I yeah. think it's probably like oh five or six, hey, something or like that. Yeah, like, yeah, I think so. Okay, yep, yeah. So I get up there and uh, okay, so just to put it all in perspective as <laughs> as we get into the combat uh, portion here. Um, B-52 guy nukes, All right. uh, primarily, uh, Air Force Academy, uh, staff, ALO. <laughs> Super tactical, right? Yeah. All, the, yeah. all these tactical. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, luckily, uh, and not that it had anything to do with anything, but it, it was not like I was unfamiliar with firearms. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, I, so I get up there and, and um, the, you know, I really kind of uh, was um very respectful of who i was joining you know mm -hmm. i i had talked to a guy i was when, when i was in the cat at acc there was this old crusty uh i think he was a senior um and he was tack p guy and okay. i wish i could remember his name to give him that the accolades but uh so we would just chat and and i'd so tell me about it you know and it it just sounded like really cool and and uh you know, when I went up there, I, I kept that in mind. It's like I heard some of his stories and and uh, and just the idea that these guys are serving with the army. And and I'm, this is this was formed over years with the community mm -hmm. and tech P and everything. But the one thing I'll say, because I don't want to forget to say this, is I've never seen anything more impressive in the Air Force than a senior airman standing toe to toe with a fire breathing battalion commander lieutenant colonel army guy spitting fire and yeah. holding his own and that's a senior airman right you know that's a united right. states air force senior airman against the cream of the crop in the army they don't make slugs battalion commanders infantry sure. battalion commanders you know right and all the units i served with they they were the you know the 82nd 10th mountain you mm -hmm. know all the the and, and I've seen it more than once. So, yeah. you know, later on when I get to brag and, and we're going to um, Airman Leadership School, it was embarrassing. Like our guys were taking all the wood and which like yeah. getting all that. And it's like you, you can't comp like the sheet metal bender, all due respect, you, you can't compete with what right. our, you know, our guys do. So, yep. So I show up there, love the area, um, uh, bought a house uh on the indian river uh you've been up there i've only been tdy there a couple of times i've never yeah. really been in the area 
there was like a, I think black, they had one bar in Watertown we went to. And that was okay, funny. yeah, well, <laughs> the bar in Watertown. Yeah, right. <laughs> Uh, the, you got the Black River and then you got the Indian River and the Indian River is small and it feeds into the Black River. Black River is pretty big and it's one of the, you know, like white water rafting areas and stuff. So lots of fun stuff to do. Not that I got to take advantage of it because yeah. right after I got there, um, within months, you know, 9-11 happened and yeah. uh, we we're off to the races. But when I got there, I knew I didn't know anything. So I grabbed, uh, you know, the NCOs and re just respectfully, you know, I, I mean, I didn't know anything about the current deal. I knew aviation, I knew airspace, you know, I knew stuff, but I didn't right, right. know their jobs. So I, and that's a, di I mean, in your defense, that's a different animal. I mean, it, there's nobody having been only air force, even talking to a guy at ACC only gives you just a glimpse of that world. I mean, it's a, it's a completely different culture, different site, you know, just everything is just different about attack P at an army post than in a regular air force base anyway. So, so in your defense, I can understand how there'd be like a lot of, a steep learning curve, I guess. Yeah. Sure. And yeah. it was a, a very, uh, uh, fulfilling as far as, uh, you know, I was kind of getting it, you know, I was mm -hmm. learning and, um, you, you know, you can do, you can go two ways. Cause I saw it as a commander down the road, uh, multiple times, you can come in there thinking you're, you're hot stuff. And, you know, the guys will look at you and you're instantly adversaries, you right. know, now you got to prove yourself, you know, versus like my thought was, okay, wh wh what am I, I mean, I, I honestly, I need to learn this. And I had no idea, you know, the towers are coming down, you know, right. but I felt like I need to be good at my job. So I, I need to learn and, and, uh, had some great, uh, initial guys, uh, kind of helping me out and I'll list them all that I can remember, you know, and, and as the incidents come out, but, uh, so, uh, we had an ALO, uh, um, Deanna Violet, a uh, female, um, obviously, and she uh, uh, was pregnant. So she had second brigade. And so again, nothing happened yet. So I was gonna take her place. I was uh, Shaq Beauchene trying to help me out. Oh, what I was, reason I mentioned all that other stuff about the, so I got passed over multiple times. So I'm a, mm. I'm a major. Uh, like I'm, I'm like an old major, I like okay. I, I've been passed over like two <laughs> times, three times, by the yeah. time, two times, I think by the time this happened. And, uh, um, so I get up there and, uh, so he's trying to help me out. So he makes me the director of support and which is, you know, it's a thing, I guess made up. Sure. But, uh, yeah. So I, I, I lived in the vehicle bay and with a couple of the guys and, um, they did their job and I watched them and, and, uh, but I, my primary job was to become an ALO. So, okay. uh, when, um, the towers, uh, 9 11 happened, uh, you know, we're right there. And, uh, so, uh, we're down, uh, we're in the middle of a, um, a briefing and, uh, Shaq's at the head of the table. Um, uh, Joe Snow, uh, he's the DO, he's sitting there, John Schmidt. Uh, Deanna Violet, um, uh, and then, uh, you know, the whole table's rounded out and it was funny cause <laughs> in the, we lived in this world war two barracks yeah. and, uh, there was a column on the side that I was sitting on and there was two columns, sorry. So you, you'd have chairs, chairs, column, chairs, chairs, column, chairs. So it would look like like an organ with people's heads going back and forth all the time. It was such a piece of junk building. I had oh, like a yeah. dead rat in my wall. It stank yeah. for a year, you know. Anyway, uh, that's so, funny. Just not to get off the subject, but that defines tech peas at that era. Like everybody had that crappy building. Everybody lived, you know, nobody had the good stuff. It was that's just the way our kind of our, our anyway yeah that yeah. that sounds sounds very familiar yeah yeah and funny uh you know I'll, I'll forget if i just go chronologically but after uh we deployed and and we started fighting the gwat fort drum got modernized rapidly they got so much money thrown at them except for us oh really <laughs> yeah <laughs> now they have a new building today and everything but yeah yeah it's a lot better now for sure yes. yeah but back yeah. then it was like yeah, yeah. so yeah. uh um Shaq leaves the room and 
a couple of minutes, we're all just sitting there. Snowman's going through the slides and it's just mundane stuff. And then uh, he comes back in and he goes, okay, we're all dismissed. And then um, I don't know if he told us there, if he called in a select few, but down in the flight room, they were watching it on TV. And yeah. uh, um, so I go down there and I was, you know, I, New Jersey, been in New York dozens and dozens of times in my life. And uh, I said, there's no way that building's coming down. And yeah. um, just as I say that, there it goes, you know, and then I was just in such disbelief. And so was everybody else just riveted. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So they locked us down. They, nobody's going home. You know, we're all locked down and uh, it was pretty tense. We didn't know what we were going to do. And then later on, they they let everybody go. And um, so uh, uh, then we start planning. And um, uh, it was interesting because, you know, what our first mission was. So and so now I'm the guy. I'm, I'm the one who's going to go. And uh, we're planning a mission to take what was called the Rainbow Bridge. And that was between Uzbekistan and uh, Afghanistan. So okay. it was supposed to secure the uh, LOC. And so the 10th Mount was that that was their plan. So we're planning sessions, planning sessions. And then um, uh, at this point, uh, this is a couple of weeks go by. We're still planning. Uh, L.A. General Longoria, uh, Colonel Longoria at the time, 18th ASOG commander, takes Shaq. Uh, sends them to um, Uzbekistan to be the task force dagger ALO in a mm -hmm. sense, you know, to run uh, the siege of Soda North uh, air ops. Um, okay. So I think rock Davis went with them. Uh, a couple other guys um, shoot. I, I hate missing guys names. Um, so uh, snowman takes over and then we have a meeting uh, and it's okay. Now we're getting planning and earnest. And he points at me, he's telling everybody what they're doing. And he says, you're out. And I, I'm like, wait a minute. What do you mean? I'm out. And he goes, you're out. Uh, group wants you to go to Pope. And I'm like, you know, cursing inside to myself and, and uh, really disappointed, uh, pissed off, you know, whatever. Yeah. And uh, so they put, uh, I think it was John Schmidt put in Deanna's place. And, and, uh, so he's now the, the, uh, the lead, uh, the primary ALO. And, uh, so the next event was me going down to, um, uh, Pope never met. Uh, I met general, oh, sorry, general Longoria right after nine 11, he, he did his world war tour. So he yeah. went, uh, everywhere and he visited all the units and, he stood in front of us and he gave a very motivational speech. Like you're going to go, you know, I, 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 he said, I don't know when anybody's going where, but uh, there's no doubt the nation will need you kind of thing. And then he, then I went up to him and, you know, as he's walking out the door and I introduced myself and I think uh, Shaq had told him about me and my background. What he was trying to build was the 93rd A gal. Okay. And his vision for it is different than it manifested into today, sure. but it, it had a lot to do with my knowledge of the CRG. And so taking over an airfield and setting it up and stuff. Okay. So it turns out that's what he wanted me down there for work on that stuff. So I get down there, I go, So it's it a good thing because it was like, he, he saw your talents, but you were like, I'm not, that's my old life, man. I don't want to do that stuff now. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, yeah. and I'm still like, I, I'm just, boiling and yeah. I, I can't tell you how how bad it felt you know like yeah. it's like your girlfriend dumped you <laughs> your dog died you know all of that wrapped up at the same time so i as soon as i walked through the door uh uh colonel maresca is the deputy and he's sitting there and i said i gotta talk to colonel angoria asap and he goes okay well come back tomorrow i'm in civilian clothes just got in um oh, you've been to brag a bunch right yeah, yeah yeah so i'm staying at that flea bag that's still running hotel right outside <laughs> right. so i see him the next morning and i can't i have no idea what he said because all i'm thinking about what is what am i gonna say right and right. i said hey sir i i didn't join the military to make slides and i said i understand what you want to do i can do that and fight at the same time and he said 
he goes, don't worry, you know, don't worry, you'll get in, in, in it. You know, and I'm thinking, oh, here's a story I didn't tell you. The reason that that felt like that was because when I was at Fairchild, so I'm the, I'm like the, you know, and again, not, not bragging. I'm just stating the fact I'm, I'll just say one of the best bombardiers in the unit. We won the Fairchild trophy, no, no relation to the name of the base, but sure. to the guy. Um, and, and that is the ultimate trophy win in, in bombers in a bombing competition. Okay. So we won that. And, uh, so I thought I was somebody right. And, uh, so uh desert storm kicks kicks in right okay. we're out there me and my crew and other crews we're on diego garcia which is the biggest bomb dump in the pacific loaded right. you know we could be loaded for bear in five minutes and start flying caps over kuwait you know whatever yep. you know so we're the dod or the air force or somebody decided that uh the H's will be nukes and the G's will be conventional. So H guys had to go recall to, into the G's to go drop bombs. You know, we drop Jeez. conventional bombs all the time. So yeah. anyway, uh, so we come back. Uh, so instead of staying there, which that's where everybody deployed to Fairford, England and, and Diego Garcia, mm -hmm. um, I go back to Fairchild and I go to the squadron commander, um, rest his soul he's since passed away but i said hey um i gotta get in this you know again i didn't join the air force to uh just fly in circles all the time I, you know and, right. and i feel i have earned it and he said um i'll tell you what if you go uh into scheduling which i just finished a tour of scheduling mm -hmm. he says uh you'll be on the first plane over there so and this is before desert storm happened Mm -hmm. So I take the job, I'm doing the job and, uh, <laughs> here it happens. You know, it's like, Whoa, okay. Now I'm, I'm like sitting on cloud nine. Cause I go cash in time. So I go to him and he goes, well, that's just a lie. I told you to take the job. He told you that like straight yes. up. Yes. <laughs> what a jerk. Yeah. So I'm dead. What a jerk. Yeah. So oh my God. because we were in Diego Garcia in the window, you know, like I, and I, I, ref, I, I would never accept any kind of like a ribbon or, you know, like I was over there. I was just so mad that, yeah, yeah. you know, so I was like, mm. oh man. Anyway, so when this, so you still have up, that stuck in your head, now 9-11 comes and now you're, again, it's happened. You're, you're like, <laughs> now I'm doing this stuff, same stuff again. I, I don't know oh. what kind of, uh. Um, I mean, um, I'm trying to think <laughs> like where I would have ended up if that's what I would have done in, um, after nine 11 was make yeah. slides. I don't, I don't yeah. know. I, I I'm going to, I was going to use a, um, I'm trying to be funny, but it's probably too dark <laughs> to go there, but <laughs> they would start using my, my middle name, if you know what I mean, you, oh, know, okay. you know, like. Yeah. Lee Harvey Oswald. It yeah, yeah, yeah. You were like Andrew maybe going postal a little bit. Yes, yeah, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, I get down there and he goes, yeah, yeah, don't worry. We'll, we'll get you in there. So, uh, but you, but you've heard that before too. Cause the yes. guy told you, he's like, yeah, just go over to scheduling and we'll get you in there. So you, you, you probably are a little skeptical at least. I mean, I don't know. Oh, it's hard. I was hard. LA is man. a lot. He's a lot more of a stand up guy than most. And he, but I didn't know. his word is his gold. So, um, you could probably, I mean, in that regard, you probably were like, okay, he's, He's going to look out for me. But I didn't know him. Oh, okay. okay. You know, I do now, yeah. but I did not sure. then, you know, so. So I, you're a little skeptical still. Skeptical, sure. Yeah. And then, uh, I mean, I saw him for like five minutes and then he was going to, um, he had to go somewhere else. And then the rest of us uh, were deploying uh, from the group. So now I'm, I'm part of the group package and we're going to go to Robin's. Then we're going to catch Miller to um, Camp Doha. Okay. And uh, so this is weird because I'm like, okay, 9-11, we're going to war, you know, and it's, you know, like November or whatever. So we're, we go down to Robbins and uh, it's the weirdest thing because this is not how I thought I'd go to war the first time. So the, this first time I'm sitting on the plane we got our weapons. This is a commercial airliner. We got like a snack in front of us, <laughs> little <laughs> bottles of whiskey 
M4 what? stuff underneath the, 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 <laughs> your feet and your, you know, a bag in a C or I think it was in, no, we had a bag stored underneath anyway. And we're taking off and I hear in the headphones, it's like, um, I don't know, clearance, clear water revival plan or something like that. And I go, <laughs> man, this is not, what I thought what going to war would be like the first time right. now it changes sure. later, but, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we get over there and we set up ops and it's uh, like the 18th day SOG is um, the, what we call now the Jace for mm -hmm. third army. Uh, so I'm doing that stuff for like three days and it's miserable, you know, it's yeah. meh, whatever, you know? And then, so what happened was uh, the date is December 5th and that's the day that a B-52, uh, Fratted, uh, um, an ODA killed some Afghans, I think killed a couple of, uh, green berets. So general Longoria sent the B 52 guy to, uh, camp Rhino with the Marine. Okay. So task force 58. Yeah. So, uh, then I thought, okay, what, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, uh, I had all my crap and, you know, we were still carrying around gas masks and, yeah. and all that stuff. And so I got two big a bags, the rucksack, and I have no weapon because the, the, uh, senior enlisted, uh, leader at Fort drum or sorry, at the 20th said, uh, officers don't get long guns. So, um, Okay. So now I'm wow. going someplace by myself <laughs> to, to no uh, pistol. Did you have a sidearm at all? I had a sidearm. Just... Sure. Okay. Yeah, good. Good. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, something. so yeah, something. So, uh, um, still, yeah. Yeah. So when it, when it came time, I got to go, you know, go. So now I'm going to war by myself and it's just like, just get there. So camp Rhino was in, um, try to remember the village or whatever, but, it was the Marines with General Mattis was okay. the ball. He was the task force uh, commander and he had a um, Talsi out there uh, running the airlift support. <clears throat> so uh, um, we go to um, Ali Al Salim is where I was catching a flight. So I had some, one of the guys that said, help me figure out how to get there. So um, we had this plan, going to drive to Ali Al Salim. Then I was going to catch a hop to Seab and then from Seab get in with a soft bird at MC-130 into uh, Camp Rhino. They were doing lift in there uh, on a nightly basis for ammo supplies and stuff. Okay. So we stop at uh, Ali Al Salim and um, we go to the uh, security forces detachment and said, hey, can I borrow a rifle? <laughs> <You know? laughs> so it was a, like a negotiation kind of thing. Yeah. And, and so luckily they had uh gal fives and, and uh, so I, I, I got one nice. and I, I started looking at it, you know, and I'm, it's like this rattly piece of, you know, it, it had to be, it's like the day one of manufacturing gal five. Right. That was the one that came off the assembly <laughs> line. <laughs> So that's my weapon. And this will come back to bite me later. Oh no. Um, so, uh, I drive to Ali Al Salim. One, one quick funny story is so that airman is like airman basic driver. Yeah. And then one of the NCOs came with me, I think maybe two of them, and they were just going to drop me off. So we're driving and, uh, um, the kid's nervous, you know, and he's, we're driving through, uh, there's, stuff all over the place. And, uh, I think there was like, Oh, there was a dead camel on the side of the road. And this dog is just gnawing on it. Oh, <laughs> and, and, and the kids like, it's, it's a, it's a freak show, you know, yeah, it's yeah. really scary, you know, yeah. but he said something funny, like, um, tearing the ass out of the camel. I mean, it was something funny and it made us laugh. And I think it really made his day that he, he, he made the older dudes, the, uh, some, he guys. said something. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So he, he really lightened up after that point. <laughs> so he dropped me off. I get a schedule. I get on a, um, MC 130, and it was a waiting game. Uh, and I was going in with um, 
French, British, Australian, and uh, Turkish special forces. Okay. So there was about 10 of us on there. Um, they had a couple of vehicles loaded up and everybody had their, their stuff. Mm -hmm. So we take off, we get up airborne. And just as we go into uh, the box, they put up, you know, they turn off the lights, you know, they go, uh, clandestine mode or whatever. Mm -hmm. So we're getting close and we start taking Sam's and, uh, Jeez. they were popping off air bursting around the aircraft yep. and the pilot was, was jinking and jiving. And, and I got that part, yeah, yeah. you know, I, I knew what he was doing. And, uh, so everybody strapped in and, um, you could just hear him popping, uh, around the aircraft. Turns out the entire base was, uh, under assault. No way. It was getting rocketed and mortared. And then, uh, we were taking, uh, uh, the Sam's and, and at the fourth one, uh, it really like, it just was like this lightning flash. And I thought, okay, this is it. Uh, yeah. And you know, I, I figured that I wasn't scared, but what I, I was kind of sad. Cause I, I, like you like were I said, almost there. You almost made it. Yeah. <laughs> almost there. Oh. And you know, my, my poor wife, yeah. you know, my family is going to be so sad cause I'm dead, you yeah, know, my yeah. dog, you know, <laughs> right, all right. that kind of stuff. <laughs> and then, uh, at the fourth one, he, he pitched out a client started climbing and he had enough. Yeah. So we went back and I just said, you know, to myself, I go, well, that I'm still under orders. So I got in line to get on the next one and, um, hop on the next one. The next one was, uh, Australian, uh, soft unit medics and they had their vehicles and stuff. Uh, it was just a couple guys, hardest person to understand what the heck he was saying. <laughs> you know, I chatted with this guy. I honestly couldn't tell you one word he said, you know, like a British guy. Yeah, I get it. I can kind of understand yeah, yeah. Uh, any kind of foreigner that's speaking English. I can understand, sure. but an Australian speaking English, I, I, you just I'm get sorry. It. I, I didn't get it. <laughs> so we, uh, we, we went back and this time, um, made it in and, um, uh, this is also a recurring theme by myself carrying all my crap and it's an, a dirt strip. So that the, that powdery yeah. dusty sand is, you know, so thick and I'm wading through it. And yeah. I'm like, mm, you know, and just kind of gritting my teeth and like, I got no direction. I got no POC. I got nothing, Man. you know, so I'm just showing up here. So I walk through this wooden uh, shacky door that looks like, that's, this is probably, it's a, it's an old mud hut, mm -hmm. but it's, you know, it's looks like it's got antennas sticking out the top. So I figured it's gotta be the headquarters. Sure. So I go in and I, and I turn around and there's general Mattis there standing there, you know, kind of the man, the man, and he's reading the riot act to his aide or something, just like, meh, meh, meh. you know, so I figure, well, I found the guy. <laughs> yeah. So I start walking up to him and I'm like, sir, I'm, and he goes, who the F are you and what the F are you doing on my airfield? But not in a nice way. Right, right, right. You, you know, and uh, he's, he is just beat red and steaming. And I, I said, sir, I'm major Donnelly. And I, I'm, he said, who, who sent you here? And I told him, he goes, who the F is that? And uh, <laughs> I said, well, he's the 18th days. I grab your and he goes uh, to his aide. He he says, "Grab the major's bag." And he, no kidding, walked me to the end of the airfield, uh, carrying all my. And he's carrying my bags, like Madison. I said, "I Madison." And I said, <laughs> "I can carry my own stuff." And you know, knowing all the t the whole time, I don't care what he's. I'm not going anywhere. Right, right, right. You know. So he goes, uh, "You have a weapon," and I said. You know, I feel like, man, can you any be any more condescending? No doubt, no doubt. You know, so I'm I'm like getting kind of pissed, and I said, yes, sir. And he says, do you know how to use it? Uh. And I go, <laughs> yes, sir. And so it's this rattly old Cal five, and he goes, well, you need to lock and load because the enemy is right outside the berm. I go, yes, sir. So I cannot get the magazine to see, <laughs> no matter what I do. Uh. So. <laughs> I'm sitting there, I'm walking down a thing, kind of holding the magazine into the, yeah. <laughs> the, the weapon. Yeah. And I, I'm so like, 
I'm so pissed now because, you know, like, I don't want to have him be right. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Like, like the magazine falls in the dust yeah. or something. Like he's that. like this air, this air force major is coming into my, a he's like a hardcore Marine, you know, just like, Oh yeah. yeah. You don't want to give him anything, any more ammunition he's already got for sure. No. <laughs> so we get to the end of the field and there, there's a Talsi. So airmen, you know, CCT guys. And uh, so he said, Hey, get the major on the next plane out of here. Um, put all this stuff over here, you know, whatever. So they left and, uh, I turned to the captain and I said, I'm not going anywhere. Uh, you know, if you want to give me a, uh, um, just point me in the right direction, who do I go to talk to, you yeah. know, to, uh, do my job. I'm supposed to be here to help the Marines, not, not be a burden, but that's one thing I forgot to tell you is, uh, he said at the time, uh, when I said who I was, he goes, I don't, this is General Mattis in, in the talk. He goes, I don't need another shitter and eater. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, He's like, what do you do for me? you do for me? Yeah. I don't need another yeah. just taking up space. Yeah. So I, I said, sir, I think I can do a little more than that. that and uh, he's amazing, man. And yeah. And then I told him, well, so I see him later in life. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'll tell you, oh, yeah, tell yeah. you that in a bit, but he, uh, so I said, I'm an ALO. And he goes, I got those. And I go, well, you got anybody who's an expert in B-52s? And uh, he said, I would, you know, he said, that's when he just said, let's go. Yeah, yeah. And he took me down there. So I come back, uh, I E and E my way back to uh, <laughs> the, the main area. And there's, um, oh, what's the guy's name? Uh, this is uh, one of uh, General Longoria's I, I would call him friends, nemesis okay. or nemesis. Sure, sure. He, uh, uh, w grew up with him in, in the CCT business oh, okay. and they were always in competition. So he's out there, uh, this night and he's, he's the man. Yeah. So he's the air. Um, I forget what the, basically he's like the soft air guy, Okay. the commander, he's a Colonel. Yeah. And, uh, so I go down there, I plead my case. And as soon as I say, uh, General Longoria, <laughs> he goes, oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> and then he, he goes, well, let me see what I can do. I guarantee he went back there, chewed a stick of bubble gum, came back in, didn't talk to anybody. Sure, he sure, says, yeah. sorry, I can't help you. So he goes, y you're out. I'm going to get you on the plane the next morning. So then they swap out. That night he leaves and uh, Com Commodore Harwood uh, he's running the seals. He comes in. So I link up, um, Mike, uh, Blazinski mm -hmm. and, um, God, I hate missing this guy's name too. Cause he, he really helped me out, but they both were there as tack peas with the soft unit. So I kind of had a little bit of an in, um, I thought, yeah, yeah. so, uh, the, uh, ODB commander is there and he says, Hey, uh, um, we're going to do a SR mission. And uh, I, I don't have any uh, JTAC. Are you JTAC qualified? And I said, yes. Nice. And uh, so uh, I go next morning, I go with uh, the Commodore and uh, he's, he's, uh, he's an interesting guy. Yeah. He, he's an interesting guy. He's got this big scar on the side of his face. He got, and, and I asked him and he, you, you know, we're sitting there, he's eating an orange doing pull-ups of course and i'm sitting there i just got finished shaving in the mirror of the of the humvee and i this is my chance to plead the case so i said hey sir uh this is me uh you know i understand you're the the guy and i said um i'm gonna join up with the oda and help you guys out i'm gonna go on an sr mission i'll be your jtac if, if you clear it with the general and he goes i don't care that's fine. Right. And he didn't say that's fine. He just said, I don't care. So we're chatting. And I said, uh, you know, like, Hey, where'd you get the scar? Yeah. <laughs> you know, on your face. <laughs> He's like, that's not, it's not really like what dudes do. Like you don't ask people like where they got your scar. And I go, Oh, okay. What was it embarrassing? Like, yeah, right. You got it yeah. in grade school or something. And he goes, no, he got it in the knife fight. And it's like, oh, okay, well, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. We went, uh, and that point I met the ODA and then we were, we were, uh, next thing we were going to do was go out on the mission and, and, um, the two JTACs were going to stay there and 
as they were supposed to with the, with the unit there with the Marines. And I did get a chance to kind of brief the Marines on uh, using JDAMs from B-52s and stuff like that. It was like one time I, I talked to one of the Marines and, and he kind of got it. He was an ALO. So he appreciated it. Um, and then uh, we pushed out the next day to do the um, SR mission. And, and the, the mission was focused on the Marine detachment or the task force was going to go take Kandahar. Okay. So uh, we were going to do the, the, uh, the reconnaissance around uh, the Western flank and join back up to participate in the assault the next day. Okay. Um, so um, I'm in one, where it's two vehicles. We're pulling a trailer. Um, it, it's kind of an interesting story, but it's kind of a long story. Uh, but again, this is, you know, 15 minutes ago, I didn't know what ODA stood for, Right, right. <laughs> you know, and now I'm on one and the guys were great. You know, they, they didn't know anything, they didn't care. They didn't ask me, you know, they just knew I had firepower and a, and a radio, sure. you know, so that's what mattered. And as we were going, you know, I was checking in with, uh, Shack, uh, not per se, but with uh, solar was their call sign mm -hmm. up in Uzbekistan and checking for air, you know, what was available. And um, so there was a couple opportunities that we came across some Taliban and, you know, it was going to be, a, it would have been a clean kill, but uh, they did not want to um, stir anything up sure. or alert anybody as they were getting ready you know that wasn't their mission for sure um, yeah that's like the yeah. opposite of what an sr for, would be for for sure yeah you want to be in exactly. and out don't let anybody know you're there for sure yeah yeah i know yeah. but you, I, I could see how you would be like man yeah, i could just control some cast real quick and then we'll get back to this sr you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah and that would happen a couple times and then uh we linked up with the uh with the uh, Marines once we finished again, we crossed a, a pass with a, uh, this was actually funny. I took a picture uh, cause we were going over this overpass and right in the, in the Wadi, I guess it's all dried out uh, was a BMP and it was all Taliban black flag, black turbans and stuff. And, you know, I was just like, Hey, how are you doing? Really? And I'm like, yeah. And I'm like, and they're just sitting there. They, they're they not like, they don't know what's going on. Yeah. Cause I think it's like, this is really like the first time they're seeing us. Okay. Because, you know, like, they why were are they here? And, like, what's, are they, yeah. yeah okay. What is this, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. That was a so weird, we was a weird a thing in the beginning there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, and oh, sorry. The, the, one of the most uh, memorable parts, which I almost forgot <laughs> was, uh, uh, we went to, uh, the city was, uh, the village was Lashkarga, mm -hmm. but, uh, we stopped at this teeny little village before that. And we actually got ourselves into a, a little bit of a, uh, uh, dangerous situation because you know how they got those little mud walls all, all over the place mm -hmm. about two feet, three feet high. Yep. We pulled a Humvee in there and there's no, like you, no way forward and it's really hard to back out yeah. and so it was a bad move sure so we're sitting there and there's all these guys like these old you know dudes with the beards and the ak standing around and and uh i thought well but we're it's just us you know we're there we're not um i think we had all that that the old crappy um flak vest okay you know, we don't have body armor uh you, you know and we're kind of driving around with our soft caps and stuff and we're now with the people, which I thought this is what I thought would be like to go to war. And then we're supposed to be liberating these people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I went the, the meanest, baddest guy with the with the AK with the bayonet on it. I just went up to him and I, I stuck my hand out and his face lit up. He smiled this big smile with all these missing teeth right, and right. stuff. <laughs> And it was like, it was really cool moment. And all these kids come running up then and we're giving them charms, you yeah, know, yeah. everybody had charms. Yeah. So they, they really uh, kind of started to get to be a little bit of a nuisance. <laughs> and so the, the ODA c captain, uh, you know, he's the boss. I'm a major, but I'm, you know, he's the boss. Sure, sure. So he's like, Hey major, stop um, doing the goodwill stuff. And, and uh, <laughs> you know, get us some coordinates or something. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, 
so we press on and we link up with the the Marines and and uh, so this guy uh, this captain with the Marines was an ALO the night before. So while we were out there, I think we kind of heard all this going on, but the, there was a road highway one, I think was um, where we were going to marshal off of and then attack into the city and then take the airport. And uh, there was this big convoy of Taliban. So we're thinking maybe that was the, the guys that we passed might've been the scouts or something. Mm -hmm. So anyway, this captain started laying waste uh, that night to all of the stuff that was going up and down the road. So he's he's all pumped up and he's chatting it up with everybody as we're getting ready to roll. And I, I was about to tell you, we blew our transmission on the second vehicle. Oh, no. So we're having to tow it. And it's just this is not the way that you think you would go no. <laughs> into an assault, you know. <laughs> so they ended up tying our humvee which wasn't running to a lav so we got the back of the lav in our faces and it's you, you could the the driver uh the sergeant couldn't hold it because it was just too much uh of pulling the vehicle oh. so the wheels turned sideways almost broke his arm and it just started pouring like dirt into our vehicle. Like I, I'm, I'm like really trying to stay alive, breathing and <laughs> trying to stick my head out the thing. This is what a triumphant charge into Kandahar, you know, but anyway, Gosh. that guy would come back later, that captain. Uh, so he's all, you know, pumped up and stuff. And I tell him who I am just so we're linked on the air control business stuff. So, um, Texas 17 was the call sign. Uh, not exactly sure which ODA or, but it was, or I think it was CCT and, and it might have been um, one of our guys okay. um, that did all the damage that prevented us. We didn't even have to fire a shot yeah. by the time we got to the car. It was, it was not, they were knocked out. Everything, uh, they had ZSU 23 fours and, all that stuff was taken out and it was all that ODA uh, doing all the good work before the Marines even got there. Okay. So we roll in and, and now I'm, I'm with this ODA and I end up uh, doing different missions with them for about two weeks and uh, it was great. Yeah. You know, they were great. Um, and then uh, the same Marine that did the, uh, uh, the action the night before I'm getting ready to go and I hear all this commotion up in the control tower um, and we're sleeping below it and he's getting ready to call in a strike on a um, ZSU-23-4 uh, and uh, I said, um, wait a minute, you know, what, what are you doing? And he goes, I don't have to tell you anything. Right. I go, well, you don't have to, but... Uh, <laughs> have you called solar and he said who's that i go well that's task force dagger they run all the odas around here you might want to check to make sure that's not one of theirs and uh because they were capturing stuff you right. know why let the enemy have something you know sure so uh he goes i don't have their number or whatever and i go well wait a minute i'll pump, pump it in here i'll put the frequency in sure enough it was an one of our ODAs and uh, our JTAC was with them. Whoa. And I confirmed, I said, okay, knock it off, uh, um, abort the mission. These are our guys. And oh, uh, the guy was been like, so horrible. If you wouldn't have been there. And he went from like, Mr. Uh, I'm, I'm the king of the world from the actions of the night before to, he came up to me later and real like, he I was like, man, thanks, man. You just kept me from, you know, killing our own guys. And I go, I know that's what we do. <laughs> yeah, that's your, no problem, you know, yeah, kind of thing. That's and, your job. Yeah. Now, yeah, was it a fluke yeah. that you were there or like, were you just having to, you just having to overhear it or like, it seemed like, like it was uh just right place, right time. Like it was just six. Oh man. How lucky. Yeah. Do you remember who the J tech was, was that the, that was uh, there with the ODA? No, but I, I think in, um, you know, kind of backtracking, I could probably figure it out. Yeah. Um, uh, cause I did, I think I talked to, might've talked to Shaq at the time, but, um, it was a major emotional moment yeah, because no if that guy would have, um, 
like kept blowing me off. I'm not exactly sure what I would have done at that point. Um, I don't know what you could. Yeah, I mean, it'd be tough. You can only if he's like a ground commander. There's only so much you can do. You know, you can't wrestle the mic away from him. I guess you could have maybe. <laughs> I guess that was that was going to be it. You know, if if you know. At least check. At least check. Like, what's the harm? Sure. Yeah, you know, what's, do... what's disconcerting is he didn't even know who to check with. Like, he didn't even know the the number to solar. Uh, yeah, man. It's, yeah. I bet he was. It's a be... Go ahead. It was the beginning, you know. It was yeah. it was early, and everybody was still, I think, trying to figure realizing out. how much we didn't know. Yeah, you know? for sure. Like, how much all of this stuff is going to be new to us. And it's not uh, – large scale combat ops, you know, where we got formations and we're doing normal stuff and the Marines got put in this position. They're all, you know, no, no one of those guys was uh battle hardened. Sure. Uh, I guess Mattis was yeah. of course, but, uh, yeah. but not, you know, the captain for sure. Oh, for sure. Not. And uh, yeah. So yeah. And then uh, I think uh, my time was coming to an end with them. They wanted me back up to, um, uh, K2, Karshi Kanaban, where the task force dagger was. And just as I was waiting for the aircraft to come, uh, there was a squad of Marines walking uh, on the other side of the airfield on the airstrip. And one of them stepped on a landmine. Oh, man. And uh, the guy knew um, he was two guys behind that guy. And he, he had all his uh, fingers taken off Jeez. with a piece of shrapnel. And the two guys in front of him were killed. And it just put a real, not that it was cheery, but it really put a somber tone to everything when I was going back. You know, it was like, um, you know, I wasn't going to, you know, hop, skip and jump around and say, you know, this is what I did. It, but it was very sobering yeah. and a reminder that, you know, this is, this is, gonna get worse i thought yeah and uh i i think it kind of stayed with me uh when i went back up to uh, uh k2 and it always i i don't know if i could say that i have this um i i think i do i i have this thing that always speaks to me i like this it's not like a voice but you know how you get uh the hair stands up in the back of your neck sure you know it's your guts telling you to, you yeah. know, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So that gut feeling, I, I think I have that, that really uh, fine tuned and that, that really was a calibrator, you know, it's like yeah. uh, that sense. And then so further on as things, things would happen, um, you know, I would have that feeling again and, and it, it would pay off. So yeah. now I get, I get on the, bird and and i fly out of there i get back to k2 and i integrate with uh shack and and the guys um but now i'm 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 like uh kind of a unique unique quantity there because i've been in the field and now i'm up here they've been rotating the jtacs i, I shouldn't say that that it was unique but to the rest of the alos um, sure. so right after i get up there i start integrating in and pulling shifts um, thanks to Shaq, you know, he's helping me out and uh, uh, got me spun up real quick. And I met um, General Mul or Colonel at the time, Mulholland, and um, his deputy were were great. And they really, at that point, they went from not wanting to not living without Shaq. Um, yeah. So he really appreciated what he had, had to offer. So shortly thereafter, so our 20th guys are are there. So we're okay. living, sleeping, sleeping in the same tent and the guys are kind of standing by because they're aligned with 10th Mountain. 10th Mountain is their sole mission right now is pulling security for K2, you know, whoop de do. Um, yeah. So they're not doing much. Did so, that Rainbow Bridge mission ever come to fruition? I mean, did they ever, did they ever secure that? Is that what kind of what they were doing up there in K2? So yeah. they... Uh, uh, what happened was the Northern Alliance took the ground around that bridge. So it was no longer necessary to um, secure it. Oh, okay. Um, and then, uh, so within, a, I don't know, a couple of weeks, maybe a couple uh, X period of time, a uh, mission came down to process the prisoners. Remember the uh, Kuala Longji prison riot? Uh, that's yeah. where uh, Chris Spann's brother got killed and, um, 
So they that's right. had all yeah. those uh, prisoners and they were going to process them through a old fort, like this ancient fort in Shevergan, which is in Western Afghanistan. Okay. So uh, I look at Shaq and I go, look, I'm kind of surplus. So, you know, I'm probably the guy I've been around. I've talked to, I, I know who's out there. I kind of know, um, you know, basically who's who. So right. who better, right? So I, so he, <laughs> right. he's like, all right. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I grab um, um, Sean Farrington and uh, Matt Aki. And okay. uh, so the three of us uh, link up with uh, small, I would say it was really like less than a company size uh, element of the 10th mountain. Uh, and it's funny cause it was like a brigade staff leading a squad, <laughs> you know, a couple of squads, <laughs> but their, their mission was to, um, uh, provide, uh, or the processing capability at the prison. And we, me and my guys were in charge of, uh, external security around the prison. Okay. So, um, Christmas Eve night, almost Christmas. And uh, again, one of these surreal things, we're up in Karshikanabad and, and um, the brigade commander pulls out sheet music, starts passing <laughs> it out. And we what? all, and everybody, and it's like, you remember uh, Arlie Ermey and, um, you know, the drill sergeant in Full Metal Jacket sure, sure. when he's yeah. singing happy birthday. To, <laughs> right. <laughs> so we're singing Christmas carols, you know. <laughs> <laughs> on the ramp <laughs> and uh <laughs> then we look <laughs> then we were the way we're gonna get there is um in a french i i can't remember if it was like a french version of a c-130 or if it was actually an american c-130 that we sold to the french i think it was different i think it was like a looked like a caribou kind of um okay but uh it was french so we floor loaded on it and it was hilarious because these guys, like the the loadmaster, French loadmaster, and I, I, uh, I'll say I spoke French. I took eight years of French, but I, I couldn't order a croissant now if you asked me to. <laughs> but I could understand, and and I could I could New Jersey accent out a few words, you know. But the, okay. the guy is a uh, um, heavy like flak armor for aircraft. Yeah. You know, he's got the flak helmet on and. He's got this big sausage and he's just like gnawing on this sausage. <laughs> and I, I wish I had a camera because yeah. it, what a classic image. And uh, right. so we floor load and I'm like, oh, geez, you know, we're going to fly with the French. This is going to be bad. And yeah. th those guys were awesome. They really? like, whereas, you know, what we do is we, we were spiraling up. So you take off and then you just spiral over the protection of the airfield and then you'd fly at altitude and then you'd spiral down. These mm -hmm. guys took off and they hit the dirt and they really? flew the whole way on the deck. Like just nap of the earth. Yeah. The and I'm like, yeah, this is like what we used to do in a buff. And, <laughs> right, you know, right. people are throwing up all over the place and <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking, this is cool. And at the, you know, when it You're was over, it. I said, Hey, that was awesome or something to the French, you know, in French. And, uh, so we get to, um, uh, Mesery Sharif and okay. uh, that's where we land. Then we, um, uh, convoyed to Shevergan, but the airfield. So every day we would go from Mesery Sharif to Shevergan and set up at the prison. Uh, and then they would lock down at night and then we would come back and then we would uh, billet around the airfield and we would bring um, prisoners that got processed. And there was hundreds of them. There was uh, yeah. this, I don't know how many, like uh, it was three, four hundred of them. And then the, the characters that, that the Northern Alliance guys inside the prison were hardcore. And, yeah. uh, you know, they they just wanted to bite somebody's head off. You know, they were just <laughs> mean. And I got a lot of great pictures with the local kids. And this was like, okay, now again, this is pretty cool is that yeah. here I am a liberator and here's these kids. And then here's our allies. And, um, 
you know, that, like I said, they were, they were itching for a fight. So anyway, uh, when, so Aki and I, um, were and and uh, Farrington were pulling security. Uh, and then we eventually got a, a one of the um, teams with a 240 and they set up and and so we were basically guarding the perimeter, which was surrounded by a minefield. And mm-hmm. um, <laughs> the way that they secured the minefield like a path was they would tether a goat to a stake and then the goat would um, what graze, you know, yeah, a yeah. circle. And once that circle was clear, no grass, then that circle was okay. <laughs> then they oh moved the gosh. stick. <laughs> then, Very scientific. Yeah. And then if, <laughs> if, if it was a bad day for the goat, everybody ate goat. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> Freshly filleted goat. Uh, yeah, really. So one, one day, uh, um, we hear, uh, it, it was obviously like a dish cut. We heard, uh, mm. gunfire and, uh, it was coming from the prison. So we thought, uh, Oh, you know, maybe a riot's going to start. So I, I, uh, told our guys to stay put. And I said, I asked, um, one of the army guys to come with me, uh, for security. And I had to go through the minefield and, uh, to get to the tower where, where the shots were coming from. So, um, I go, you know, to talk to the guy, I knew his name and everything. And I said, you know, come on, let's go. We got to go this way. And so next thing I knew, I turn around and he's gone. He didn't. No way. Yeah. He, he turned. He didn't tail. come with you? Nope. Nope. Oh so, my God. So I went up there. I figured, ah, what the hell? So I went up there and there's this big, like at the bottom of the tower, there's this dog with a head like this big and his nose is, is just dripping with blood and it's got this big collar with links you know this big on it and it's yeah. it's it's coming at me and then it lunges wow. and it you know stops you know not not as dramatic as you would see in the movies where it's like right here but it was yeah. like you know like close enough where it was uncomfortable yeah, <laughs> yeah yeah i won't say i could smell its breath but it was <laughs> it was uh and it was tied to a um um car frame you know like it was an old car <laughs> it was uh that it was changed dog was it, it was it like a, do- a guard dog or yes something, or? it was guard dog to guard the bottom of the tower uh, oh, okay from any intruders so i go up to so the guy grabs the dog pulls it away and and th- what the, the reason the dog was bloody they keep kicking it in the face oh. and you know i'm like man i just want to save that poor dog yeah, yeah, yeah shoot it but uh i get to the top of the stairs and there's this guy He's got one eye and it, the, the other eye is not closed. It's just like an eye socket. And he's got the big beard and, and uh, he, he's um, smoking a hookah. And I'm like, man, that's pretty cool. <laughs> that's, that's a classic, <laughs> the classic shot yeah. right there. So I, I couldn't speak, uh, you know, posh, posh well, um, I, it could have been anything. Could have yeah. been posh too. Could have been, yeah. uh, you know, Arabic, who knows what right. he's speaking. So yeah. I, I was just like, um, making hand signals, like who shot the shot. And so it turned out that, uh, he said, nobody, nobody. And I felt it was a dish gun and, and sure enough, it, it had been fired and they, um, shot guys down in the, which were Taliban, but you know, anyway, no, no point to that story other than the dog and the minefield <laughs> right. part. And then we did that for a few days and, and, uh, the guy who ran the show, um, his name, he was a major uh, with the 10th, uh, good guy, real tight, uh, like, uh, um, kind of a stiff short kind of guy, but, uh, mm-hmm. good, you know, very, very efficient. And, uh, so we would serve a little bit longer together, but unfortunately he, he went down in, in, uh, one of the helicopter crashes, uh, later in the Afghanistan oh, got killed and, um, so we finished the mission up there. We were there for like 30 days. Uh, so go back and, um, talk to, um, um, solar again. And sure enough that, that everybody's ready to wrap it up. So we'd processed all the prisoners. I think you probably got a little bit. I, I think I listened to, uh, LA's story where he was processing. They were taking the prisoners from Misery Sharif and then they would fly them into Pakistan. 
um, yeah, yeah. for yeah. disbursement. And I think onto maybe um, Guantanamo or, or wherever they went, but, you know, he had his story there and um, he was supposed to come out and visit, but I think that's when his incident occurred when the guy, uh, I don't know if he told you that one or not, where the guy got up uh, from the floor, they were floor loaded and, he, he had to fight the guy, get him back down on the ground, stuff like that. No, I don't think he did. Which one? No. Yeah. Was this? Yeah. Where was the, uh, where was, which one was this? This was, uh, he was in Pakistan. I think he was, he was either transporting with the prisoners or he was coming back from Pakistan, something like that. Oh, no. He did. He told the Pakistan story for sure. Oh, like yeah. When he was, he, yeah. So he went over there. They weren't there. And he and a couple other Pakistani dudes went and found him. And they were taking fire, and he ended up like assaulting through and like capping a few, a couple of guys or something. It was this crazy story. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what what he did, and uh, so yeah, that's, that was amazing. That was our linkage at that point. I hadn't seen him, you know, I didn't see him. He was supposed to come out there, so we didn't see him. Um, yeah. Oh, one, one I got to tell you this this little diversion yeah. here. When I was with the ODA, um, we went to uh, Mullah Omar's house. Oh, really? Yeah. And that was part of uh, before we went to, um, I think when we went through Kandahar, it's right outside of Kandahar. So it was kind of funny, like when we're driving through Kandahar, again, no body armor, soft caps on, just open vehicles, and everybody's just kind of looking at you because they hadn't seen us before. Went through this marketplace and we're driving around. We see girls in in, um, uh, school skirts you know the white top and the plaid skirts yep. uh so kind of freedom was ring, uh, ringing you know at that point cool to to feel that uh experience yeah and then at one point um we're in this marketplace i'm looking around and there's this like six foot three redheaded guy and i'm thinking like where is this guy and he's 100 percent afghan he's you know, probably russian you know something because yeah, yeah. he was probably 20 18 20 years old but oh, okay. just like stood out right here. Yeah. And, Born uh, around the eighties when they yes, were over there. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yes. And, uh, <laughs> um, but we went to Mullah's, Mullah Omar's house and I'm with this ODA team. So I'm following their lead. You know, I, I'm, I'm like, okay, you know, what, what are we doing here? There was a big, um, like a, um, cave that there was a lot of munitions and stuff in. So they were going to go, uh, clear that. And they told me just, kind of um and me and another guy just just kind of watch things around here make sure you know security wise and so a sniper opens up and uh um you know you hear the crack and i'm i'm looking at the you know this is kind of silly but i'm looking at the the oda commander like for the you know the lead what do we fire back what what do you like what's the guidance yeah what's the guidance what do we do here do we go get them you know what what and he just looks up there and he was a guy who's up on his ridge line and he goes savages and he just turns around and walks away. <laughs> so we're sitting there. So I figure, well, I probably shouldn't stand right here. So, no, no. so I move <laughs> and sure enough, I, I, I stumble across um, a cave and it's more like a spider hole. And uh, yeah. so I thought, you know, might as well do something useful. <laughs> So I pull my pistol <laughs> and I jump down into the hole and there's like drug paraphernalia, um, a hookah pipe, um, you know, like, um, surgical tubing and, Oh, really? Yeah. And then there's a whole bunch of like books, but it's all in Arabic. I don't know what it is. So, yeah. uh, secure that all, bring it out. Turns out it was actually some useful intelligence. Um, oh, right on. Yeah. So, and there was no direction to <laughs> this kind of stupid thing. I, I, I think I would say, and I, I've mentioned it this way, is uh, I really feel like I forced Gump my way through this whole experience <laughs> because it was just one thing after another. And that's where, yeah. like, I, I, I think I might have mentioned to you uh, in our previous conversation that, uh, and, and here, that, that I did say that uh, given opportunities, um, you you make the best of it you do what you think is right and if True. things fall your way then you succeed if they don't then you know somebody's going to follow you and finish the job so yeah. you want to do it right and 
I think that's the thing with General Longoria and others. You know, you know, there were there have been others that that followed before the or sorry that preceded them, that that were really interested in, in helping me out. And I think mm-hmm. once General Longoria saw that I could produce, he kept putting me in these situations. Shaq, yeah. you know, he gave me the opportunity. I'm not sh- so sure he was hot on it, but he gave me the opportunity and he introduced me. So that's something that uh, I appreciated and took with me as a leader uh, for the rest of my career is, is whenever I had the opportunity to give someone an opportunity to, to uh, maybe overcome a injustice, a, uh, you know, a bad assignment, bad rating, you know, something like that. I was sensitive to that. And I was like, sure. yeah, no, let's see what this guy's got. And, uh, and also just to really help the people, your people out, um, mm-hmm. as a primary task, uh, mission first, you know, you know, always, um, For sure. you're going to have yeah. to expend people and, and unfortunately at some point, but, but then you take care of them, especially at ground speed zero, you know, there's, you're yeah. never too busy to do that. Um, right. Damn. I wish I could remember that guy's name because uh, Bergham, Billy Bergham, and he went out of his way to make sure that I wasn't forgotten, you know? And so I really appreciated it. And then, yeah. Anyway, get back up there to um, uh, K2 and and, uh, now L.A. is getting a little antsy. He wants me back for what he brought me for. And I'm like, man, man, party's over. (laughs) So I get back to uh, K2 and start working back into the um, um, Jace, Ace uh, rotations with now some essay and experience or whatever. but almost immediately, there's word of a operation planned uh, by SOF to secure um, a valley, ma- mainly to kind of get rid of the last remnants of the Taliban. Northern Alliance has been doing a great job. They 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 basically own everything down to Kandahar, but there's a pocket in eastern um, Afghanistan and. Uh, so this is the precursor to Anaconda. Mm-hmm. So I um, <laughs> I make the case. I go, hey, look, uh, I've been out there. I've been doing it. I'm the 10th Mountain ALO. Uh, you know, Shaq is, is locked in with uh, Dagger. He can't go anywhere, so there's nobody better. These are my guys. Sure. So I should be the guy that, that goes with the 10th to do this operation. And there, it was originally planned to be a... Um, policing action, really, like they were going to set up blocking positions and they were going to process arrest or or I guess process folks and and do the biometrics and all that. They had little signs that said, you know, walk this way. Okay. (laughs) So that's what they thought it was going to be. And um, at K2, uh, start talking to um, the staff and then a couple of 10th Mountain guys were up there. And so we start planning in earnest. I get a slideshow that shows what the operation is. And that's when I, I convinced, um, I think, Ken Rozelski, who was the 682nd commander, was there as L.A.'s deputy, uh, that I was the guy. L.A. was somewhere uh, in his circulation. Um, mm-hmm. So the Air Force was saying at the time that they didn't know anything about it. And this was early... Um, December, no, uh, February, February. Uh, okay. So we're now doing the, the the planning part of it. Um, I'm going to rewind real quick. When I was up at K2, 10th Mountain was there. So we interacted with the guys uh, fairly frequently. Um, again, they're doing a security mission. So the artillery guys come up to us and they say, hey, we got an idea of how to get in the fight. And they said, okay, we're, we'll get a, a 105, we'll roll it up into the back of a 130, we'll fly into Afghanistan, we'll land, we'll get a gun crew, we'll push the, the gun out, we'll shoot a bunch of rounds, and then we'll load it back up and we'll fly away. And we're like, hmm, <laughs> I think <laughs> we have an airplane. Rate. I like that, it, yeah. Yeah, I, I, but I think we have an airplane that does that called the AC-130. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
We don't even have to land. Yeah, you don't have to here, land. Yeah. And it can actually be direct fire instead of indirect <laughs> right, fire, right. you know. But <laughs> no they were just, they were desperate. They wanted oh, to get in the sure. fight, like everybody, I think, at the yeah. at that point, especially up there. That was a, you've been, were you up there? I, I never made the K2. No. It, it is a, it's a hellhole. It's just yeah. like, I heard, I didn't hear anything good about it. Oh, no. And real remote and remote. And, and uh, it was an old uh, Soviet fighter base. And, you look like we're like if it rained at anywhere, uh, there'd be a puddle and the water oh. would be clear and stuff like that. This was like uh, antifreeze green oh. would come up out of the ground. And, you know, and now, you know, with the packed act and everything, if you were there, and yeah, you I was going to say stuff. Yeah. I mean, that's I, I, I think I did hear something about that place was one of the focal points of that, that effort. Yeah. Because people were just getting, just weird diseases and just, you know, having respiratory problems and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Not, not a, not a nice place. Um, yeah. Big, huge. Well, who knows what the Russians did there? They could have just dumped all their petroleum products right there in the base. And I mean, you know, who knows how they left it. So. Yeah. And not to mention it, uh, you know, they, they had nukes there too. Um, uh, you know, yeah. how much plutonium and stuff oh, like that was, yeah. it was just, it was a hell hole. So, yeah. um, but uh, so they were desperate. They wanted to get out of there. They want to do something other than pull security uh, on the base. And, you know, yeah. weirdly enough uh, and sadly, um, one of their guys uh, killed themselves, just, you know, put their M4 in their mouth and blew their head off for, you know, it's like, I mean, geez. And it was just a uh, real head scratcher. Why? But you I know, just couldn't take it or you yeah. just got it just. You never know. I mean, that's the thing about that. It's you just never know what's going through a guy's head at that time. You know, where they they get so caught up in what's happening, or they you know they they manifest this problem in their mind, and you know, next thing you know, they're trying to deal with it in any way they can. You know. Yeah, and uh, it really was a impactful thing too when you hear that. You know, you know, like I mean, taking casualties is one thing. Sure. But then that that that's another. And um, I'm sorry, I'm going to jump around again because I forgot another oh. story. When we were at uh, uh, Misery Sharif, we're at the airfield, and um, this <laughs> it was a uh, you know the our uh, latrine facility was a slit trench, yeah. And uh, you know there was a you had a a post driven in at the edge of the thing, so you kind of lean over. And, right. you know, you do your business. And uh, so one of the female lieutenants from uh, the 10th Mountain um, let go of the post and she oh, fell in this God. trench. Oh, no. And it's a, it's like the middle of the night. And oh, God. <laughs> all you hear is screaming. Everybody's running out with their weapons drawn and stuff. And, and oh. she is like head to toe. <laughs> covered oh, man, makes me gag a little oh bit. yeah oh. oh and then there, did you guys even have any showers or anything like how did were you there well there, how did you clean up there was um I th bottles of water oh, okay yeah, yeah. like so uh um oh. th they're trying to help her out and it's so slimy like the, i was like uh, one of her uh, buddies i guess had her by the hand slipped she fell back falls back in oh, the, oh no. it's just like Everybody's uh, doing that. <laughs> and oh, you're thinking like, oh my, like the diseases and, and oh, like we're in Afghanistan and yeah. Oh, you know, oh geez. And I know I, That's I no ate uh, some of the local food and, and uh, it had a, I had a bad reaction to it and you can Standard, imagine, yeah. you know, so oh, oh, it's yeah. just so oh, horrifying yeah. that poor thing. I, don't, I can't, I don't think I've heard anybody uh, I'm no, I think, I think everybody that I've ever talked to about Afghanistan has had some sort of story like that, like <laughs> eating the food or, you know, you just, it, it just runs rampant. And once some, once one guy catches something, just runs rampant right through the, the safe house or the cop or the, whatever it is. And yeah, it's just, it's bad. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Amongst other things. That poor know. girl. Oh, Dang. Uh, I, to this day, I just, I, like you just did, I just cringe, you know, thinking. <laughs> yeah. <about it>. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, um, back to, um, we're in Kuwait, so um, yeah. we're getting uh, ready for this uh, anaconda thing. And you remember um, 
I forget the number of the unit, but the little uh, detachment that was there in Camp Doha, we had the little building. I so, um, no, I don't remember. I never made it up there. Either. Okay, so it, it it was like this hangar. Um, okay, more like a storage thing, and it had a little office in it, and that's where everybody stayed. So that's where we billeted. And uh, so, you, you know, um, you, you heard of uh, Joe Locke. He was the 93rd commander. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. That kind of reasonable. Yeah. yeah so he's a great guy. Um, yeah. And uh, but at the time, we'd never met. So okay. uh, finally get to the point where we're going to start moving out to go to um, Afghanistan again to run the air ops for uh anaconda and so i'm in the 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 jace or whatever and i start picking people the the deed you know we're gonna go down there um mike huffman was one of them uh and uh i forget to tell joe (laughs) that he's going so the next morning we're rolling and we got to leave at uh 0800 to get to the airport to get on an aircraft to get to see to get to you know to meet all the timelines and stuff and i just plain forgot to tell them so at 7 (laughs) 32 i I shake them awake and i go hey sonic i i go hey got to get ready we're gonna go (laughs) to afghanistan grab all my stuff and he was not a happy man. Uh, yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. So he runs, takes a shower and, and he's huffing and puffing, you know, for a while. And then um, we fly to uh, Sieb and it's at Sieb that I kind of formulate the plan for Anaconda. I figure you got Siege of Sotif North, Siege of Sotif South, and somebody's got to be in charge. So I, I kind of mm-hmm. assumed an ASOC role and uh figured that this 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 would be the way to kind of keep things straight still thinking it's going to be this policing action you know no no sure. big deal yeah and then uh so i drew it out no kidding on a bar napkin there's a little bar there and uh i think we actually had real beer um and uh drew out everybody had their last there was one of the guys i think it was uh Huffman was underage and uh okay so I drank his beer <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know hey somebody's got to do it right yeah you had to yeah, yeah no <laughs> so uh um drew out the plan we we slapped the table said okay this is what we're going to do and then uh we take off the next day we fly into um ba- I think it was Bagram no it was someplace else yeah no we flew in a bet let's just skip to we got to Bagram <laughs> And then uh, we set started setting up operations. So the tenth mountain is building the talk um, inside of the. uh, There's a big hangar there, old Russian hangar, and they're putting tents up and stuff inside of it. And then there's, um, uh, you know, it's all got uh, holes in it from us, I think, uh, bombing it. And uh, so uh, we had a small team, and then we also had uh, a. Our JTACs were with the 10th Mountain uh, 187. So that was Aki, Lloyd. Um, we had Ren, Wilchensky, um, Farrington, a couple other guys. I think I'm, again, sorry, I'm, I'm missing somebody. But uh, so. Uh, There's a bunch of good guys there. Yeah. And uh, yeah. we start doing uh, everything. Oh, um, Vic McCabe. Um, and yeah, him and Aki were teamed up. And uh, okay. so we put the plan together. We're starting to build the talk and we're getting close. I'm, I'm going to leave out some details because I could talk for a day and a half on this <laughs> because there were so yeah. many funny things and interesting things that that had happened. But uh, the bottom line is, is that, you know, we really got the 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 classic attitude from the tent you know, we're their guys, we're with them yeah. and we still were not part of the team. And, yeah. uh, uh, as D day approaches, uh, I'm I, the one thing I think that that was pivotal that, that I, I will give myself credit for is I changed the ATO. I, 
uh, at the time, things were slowing down in theater overall. You know, there wasn't a lot of activity. So they were going to stand down the bombers. Uh, they were only flying uh, uh, like four bomber missions a day. Uh, they were going to go to two ships instead of four ships on the fighters, you know, just okay. really not 24 hour coverage. So I appealed to the uh, uh, KAOC and I'm working with the CCO. And I said, you know, look, we got to have bomber coverage 24 seven. We got to go to four ships. Um, I'm going to need uh, this. And I, I said, just give me two weeks. That's tops, yeah. you know, maybe less, maybe it's 72 hours. That's the plan. But I said, let's just plant. And they said, no, no, we're, we're standing down the bombers. They've been operating at this pace for a while. I said, no, really, just don't, you know, just yeah. keep it going, you know, just for a little bit longer. And they acquiesced and said, we'll give you 72 hours. I said, okay, great. And uh, the um, D-Day is coming. And so we plan these targets. It's the first time we're going to use the thermobaric bomb and it's going to be used on a cave complex. So we had F-15s with the thermal barracks, B-1s and B-52s, each hitting. Uh, the B-52 is going to strike the whale, which is a big uh, um, terrain feature where there was uh, mortar pits and et cetera. Um, and the interesting thing was the Army kept claiming that it was only going to be uh, about 150 to 200 enemy in the area. So uh, something that little voice in the back of my head when I was at K2 with Shaq, I was sitting on pulling my shift and the uh, uh, sergeant, uh, he was fire sergeant was on the radio and he was just getting a call from an ODA from a safe house. And it said, or they were telling him that there was a group, he said it could be a bit as big as 2000 of Taliban and foreign fighters with their families that want to surrender. So the uh, dagger said, sounds fishy, sounds like a yeah. trap, you know? So, so now in the back of my mind, the Air Force intel is telling us there's about 2000 people in that valley. And the army is like, nope, 150, 200, this is gonna be quick policing action. So I, I said, okay, well, what are we looking at for enemy fire support? And they, they said, well, there's uh, 22 dishkas uh, around the valley. And they were maybe like, I think there was maybe like a dozen actual, like they got imagery of it. And then the rest yeah. were templated. They said, well, okay. you know, we're probably going to put, the, they would probably put these there. So I go, okay. Based well, on that template, they're like, well, they're, this is, they're probably a more. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. So like there's a, there's a something that looks like a great HLZ helicopter landing zone. And there's a, there's a ridge right above it. That's where you would put a dishka, you know? Sure, so, sure. and a dishka for everybody is a 51 caliber machine gun and, and it's, it's a uh, heavy. So it's a enemy of the helicopter, uh, especially yeah. coming in for, an assault like landing. Um, and I think that's one thing I always admire about the Russians is with against NATO, they always made their stuff one notch bigger than ours. So they could right. use our ammo and we couldn't use theirs. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, pretty smart. Absolutely pretty brilliant. Smart, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I said, hey, we gotta we gotta give us an air campaign. You know, give me give me a couple days and we'll hit all these positions, people, no people. Um, you know, we'll soften it up, we'll smack the HLZs, not cratering, but we'll, you know, use air bursts and stuff to just clean them. And mm -hmm. uh they were like, Nope, we need to maintain <laughs> the element of surprise. So uh we, we were surprised. Um, yeah, because there were a, a ton of enemy in that valley. Um, yeah. So D Day kicks off, and um, oh, sorry, right before D Day, uh, first or not first sergeant, the um, sergeant major of the division. Uh, I, I'm getting ready. We're scrambling. We were working like 24 hours a day to get ready, and um, you know, getting freaks. We had a KY 58 uh, set up and. Uh, you know, so we can have a hotline to the chaos and all this stuff. And mm -hmm. um, 
I told the guys, go get chow and bring it back here, eat it. We don't have time to sit down, you know, take a break, whatever. So uh, I think it was um, Sean Farrington comes back and he goes, hey, sort of, <laughs> Sergeant Major won't give us any chow. I go, what? And what? He, he said, yeah. He said, you're probably going to have to come out here. So I, mm. you know, so I put my stuff. The last thing you want to do. Yeah. yeah. Last... You're busy and. Right. I walk out there and I go, hey, Sergeant Major, what's going on? He goes, if you don't serve, he goes, the rule is if you show up first for chow, you serve the chow. And uh, he said, unless you serve the chow, you don't get chow. He goes, you don't clean the latrines, you don't use the latrines. You don't clean the shower, you don't use the shower. I said, okay, I guess we'll eat MREs and, and <laughs> a drench or a, a hole or something. I go, you got, I said, you got to be kidding me. We're going to, yeah. we're your close air support. And in this upcoming, you know, if it, this goes south, you're going to need us and we're not ready. We need to go, you know, and we didn't eat. We turned around, we walked back, we broke out the few MREs we had. And mostly we ate MREs until uh, a few days into it when when uh, they started to appreciate the fact that we were saving their lives, then, yeah, then yeah. we got to eat. But um, it's a classic, you that know. That is so crazy. That <laughs> I'm sure that never happened to you. Oh, wow, um, well. The, that it's, it's been a, that's a point of contention with, with tech peas because the problem, and this is kind of a, an inherent problem. I don't want to get off topic, but this is just a, since we're talking about it and we, I kind of talked about this, about this with Jared Taylor, as far the, the inherent problem with attack P with a JTAC is that you're a senior airman or a staff or whatever. And you're walking in there. And like you said, you're going toe to toe with these battalion commanders and these XOs. And you're, you're the, supposed to be this liaison for the air force and then but then they look at you like you should be cleaning the latrine or serving chow you know what i mean it's like it, it's kind of a tough it's a tough situation you obviously probably wouldn't have that issue but like you know your guys going over there without you they are looked upon as like lower like at spec four or something so it's very challenging to kind of overcome that idea they have of a lower enlisted guy so yeah i, I could see it, it it happens more often than not where you kind of have those run-ins with the army and they're like we well, should be doing this stuff it's like well i no, i hear you but i'm more i'm, I'm on the commander staff i'm not a i'm I, you know i'm not just a, a grunt you know so it's frustrating anyway I, yeah and and yeah. it's it brings uh, back memories from me being an airman yeah. and having to fight those battles you know well and it was really uh i don't think they ever uh deferred Maybe when I was in 06, but never before to rank. It was always, hey, Air Force, you know. So oh, yeah, that's even, yeah, exactly. That's a good point. Yeah. You're already a second class citizen because you're an Air Force guy. <laughs> so then you got to over. Yeah, I yeah, know. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It, it, yeah sorry. it was just it, it made it perfect. You know, like here yeah. we were uh, soon to be and, and really the fight for our lives for, for the guys that were uh, going toe to toe out there and. Yeah. And, and this is what's important. And mm -hmm. the next time I saw the guy now, you know, it's a culture thing, so I don't want to hit the Sergeant Major too hard, but next time I saw him, he was passing out tails at, uh, towels at the gym back at Fort. Oh, Mill. really? Yeah. He retired. And <laughs> that was his job. Wow. So, but it was super frustrating. And, and, uh, so what, be, so, so then, sorry, we went back and some really interesting engagements that happened right beforehand. So uh, General Michalicek was the third army commander. So he was a C flick and he called, it was a, a VTC um, so we could see him. And then he had uh, General Hagenback was 10th mountain commander and task force mountain commander, obviously. And, and they were communicating about his preparations for the operation. So mm -hmm. um, General Michalicek, says um buster are you ready to go and quote yes sir if this fails it's the air force's fault so what <laughs> yes he was he was frustrated because they were trying to get fuel ammo um we were we we set up a far we we were flowing c-17s in and out, you know, we had the AMLO there was getting run ragged. He was doing the best yeah, he yeah. could. And it was just, it was just logistics. And all of a sudden, yeah. we, you know, we got uh, 101st and 10th Mountain 
uh, you know, not quite a full brigade of each, but you know, battalions of each. Uh, so you you got a you got a lot of guys. You need a lot of sure, stuff. Sure. So right. the, if it took like a day and a half instead of a day, it, it was a big deal. So they were getting all yeah. upset. But to me, to preload an excuse on a yeah. sister service like that, that's not leadership. That's bad form. That's, no, that's bad form. Yeah, yeah, bad form. So I I said out loud, you've got to be, you know, shit me. <laughs> And, right. and the, you know, the army guys next to me turn around, like with their eyes as big as saucers. And cause I was dumbfounded. I'm like, you, I, I couldn't believe it. It's like, yeah, this that's... is, this is not Ike before D-Day. Right. Right. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. Calm down. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there was that. And then, uh, we were supposed to go on February 28th was supposed to be D-Day. And, uh, it's the 27th, 6th, 7th, and we're getting a brief and we get to the weather section and the, um, weather guys up there, he's a tech sergeant and no st staff, maybe a tech sergeant, uh, and the chief of staff said to him, he says, okay, so, uh, what you're telling me. So he read him the weather. The big deal was the freeze line. So the helicopters were going to come in at 8,000 feet and the freeze line was at seven. So okay. now you got a big deal because you can get, uh, ice on the blades. You can, you know, it's just, a, it's yep. not good. So, right. uh, amongst other things, visibility. Um, so the, uh, the Colonel, the chief of staff of the 10th says to the airman, it says, should this be a go or no go? And I said, sir, that's not his job. I interrupted in front of everybody. And I said, that's not his job. He tells you the facts and he can give you a recommendation on the weather, but you make, he, he, he put his hand up and he goes, airman, is this a go or no go? And the, the you know, <laughs> good, good on him. He goes, sir, based on the information I just provided, I would, I would delay the operation. And he's, and the Colonel said, okay, it's a delay. Yeah, good for him. Yeah. yeah. Good for that kid for speaking up. Yeah. He could have just been browbeaten and said, oh no, sir, you can do it. And then rushed a bunch of lies. Yep. So. Right. And yeah, the, the beauty of that, and not only did, did that save lives per se, but it saved lives because we got two more days to prepare and it actually helped a lot. Like, nice. We, we were more ready and, uh, I think the army was more ready. So we okay. launch, um, you know, D-Day comes, we're all spent already, but, uh, yeah. you know, so the, the chief of staff would become my nemesis throughout this entire thing. He, okay. he felt like he didn't get the support that he deserved. So we're, we're getting ready. And he was always nitpicking me all the time yeah. is air force, air force, air force. So uh, when the the key, we had to launch the um, uh, Chinooks before we knew whether or not the strike aircraft were on station. So there's a risk. Yeah. And so he puts it on me and he goes, okay, Air Force, where's your, where's your strikers? And I said, sir, they haven't reported in yet. And he said, so am I going to launch these aircraft? And uh, I said, sir, if I were, if I had any issue, if there were any issues, I would have been contacted by the Kayak launch. And he goes, and he points at me and he goes, okay, Air Force, but this is on your head. And I go, Jeez. where do they get these guys from? <laughs> I know. Play, they're so quick to place this blame somewhere else, man. Yeah, you, it, like, it's the pre-blame game, you know? Yeah, like, I mean, it, see, that that's, if he didn't feel comfortable, if he if that was his thought process, he should have been like, no, we're not going. All right, Air Force, I don't think, I don't quite trust you, or whatever it is. He should have just been like, no, we're not going. Not like, okay, we're going, but if anything screws up, it's on you. It's like, well, wait a minute. Let's not go then. Jesus, <laughs> yeah. forget it. I, mean, I don't want that kind of heat on me, man. Yeah. What a, oh, that's kind of, oh, that's kind of lame. Oh, it's it just, be, it'd be just beginning. 
just beginning, you know, so, Jeez. so then the operation kicks and, um, we're going, like I said, it's, it's, uh, sorry, the, the finish this, this moment, um, right after he said that, you know, like, you know, the, the, it's on you check in, you know, so oh, nice. I, well, the bombers <laughs> check in, the fighter checks in and, and I just turned with this, like, you know, shit eating grin. <laughs> smile on my face and say, uh, all strikers all checked in, sir. Uh, uh, executing as fragged or something, you know, some, some yeah, official. Yeah. So anyway, that felt good. And then, uh, yeah, no doubt we, uh, we started striking and then, um, I, I think you probably remember the fratricide. Uh, so there was, um, an issue with, uh, comms, um, it ended up, I think it was a gunship um is was actually responsible for hitting the ODA and and um killing some of the Afghans uh Afghanis oh. so that's turned into a knock it off so this big knock it off goes over the net and oh man so now the strikers that are nowhere near there they they start aborting and I didn't give the abort you know now everybody can abort that's for sure but sure. you know it, it it was, um, and, and not only that, the uh, Northern Alliance was supposed to be a hammer and anvil, and the um, Northern Alliance was supposed to be the hammer, and the 10th Mountain, 101st, was supposed to be the anvil. So they were going to yeah. attack, and then the enemy would uh, hit the blocking positions, you know, and then we start the up, you know, the rounding up part of it yep. so the ten, the um northern alliance aborts they stop and they're not pressing so now uh 187 goes in with nobody else helping oh man yeah so all of a sudden they're they're taking every fire from everybody from everywhere and that's that's uh aki mccabe um lloyd um I think ran and maybe even Farrington, but anyway, uh, the the story that I think most folks are familiar with is as Aki and uh, McCabe. Um, Aki gets hit uh, from a mortar and gets blown backwards. He thinks he's dead. His oh his mic is trashed. Um, the fire keeps coming in. So he gets uh, McCabe's radio. There's a, there's a lot more to it. I'm I'm really uh, condensing this, but uh, yeah, yeah. basically he calls in uh, B-52 to hit the ridge line where they're taking fire from. Saves the the company that he's with. The you know maybe the battalion, and the stuff's going on. And the whole thing, like I said, this 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 will would take days to talk about because it was a mix the 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 firing uh the fighting on the ground we were doing in in our, our i guess i would call it a um uh an ace or an a sock uh we were doing like six simultaneous ticks at once uh yeah. if we didn't have those aircraft there were they would have been unsupported um you know so we're we're assholes and elbows joe locks on the radio and and he's the guy he's got the classic, you know, two, two handsets right, right. in his, each ear. And he's calling in the, 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 uh, the aircraft and sending them to the JTACs everywhere. And we're calling for, uh, strikes from where we're at. And mm -hmm. so everything's going on and the GM staff comes over and he points to the screen where the predator feed is. Now I'd never seen a predator before. And this yeah. was a, uh, a company predator and, uh, I, no clue. Right. So, um, right, right. he says, Hey, see that truck right there. I want you guys to hit it. And, and again, we're like, you, you know, you're busy. busy. We're busy. Right? <laughs> and he's screaming at me that like, that's a, that it's a steak bed truck. And he says that that thing is resupplying ammo to the enemy. I go, okay, but we got your, our troops are engaged in close combat with the enemy and we're providing them close air support. So he keeps screaming at me and I said, okay, 
and I just left it the way it was because again, mm -hmm. you know, the six simultaneous saneous troops and contacts, the most I've ever seen. And that was going yeah. on for a while. And, uh, so then, uh, uh, things are getting, uh, like in a, in a rhythm, not, not a good rhythm, right. but we're, we're, we're throwing it out there and, and, um, things are happening. And, and, uh, the next thing that the, the major event is, um, Roberts Ridge. So that was really hard to, to be a part of, but also yeah. to watch because we right. had the feed and, and, you know, after it was all over, uh, all the, those key players of us that were involved were sent to, uh, Tampa for a month at CENTCOM and we were sequestered for, uh, 30 days of analysis of the operation and specifically Roberts wow. Ridge, um, for lessons learned and stuff like that. But, um, so were you guys like locked down down there or were you just like, uh, you stayed in a hotel? Yeah. We, you we were in a hotel yeah, and we just came back and forth. Sure. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't like stay in this room for yeah. 30 days. I'm yeah. Like, okay, wrong okay. word. Sequester is like, you know, yeah. I'm a jury guy and I got to stay in my hotel room. <laughs> but, uh, okay. yeah, it was interesting because, uh, I had a lot of blanks filled in from, you know, you know like obviously there, there's not, super great communication in combat. But then afterwards right. at ground speed zero, we, we could look at a lot of what happened and, and uh, you know, we, we saw Roberts and, and what happened to him specifically. And, you know, it, it made me mad. It, it yeah. made me furious and uh, I wanted to get some. So when, Things kind of got back into, you know, again, Roberts Ridge is a whole story. You know, we got Medal of Honor uh, winners from that or awardees from that, um, mm -hmm. rightfully so. And unfortunately, you know, that's where we took uh, almost all of our casualties was that one event, uh, eight guys. And there were yeah. uh, nine total. And the one was Harriman, who, who was the ODA guy at the beginning of the operation, which was a fratricide. So that, that was a big deal, but it was a thing within a thing, you know, like if, mm -hmm. if you analyze that separately and you just stick with, uh, the, the conventional op with Anaconda, um, things kept going and, and the army kept on about trying to hit this stupid truck. And at the, in the day, um, you got an F-16 with no targeting pod. And, you know, the pilot can't fly upside down at 26,000 feet and see a truck. You know, right. I mean, if he sees it, he, he would see it, but you can't search for it. So we were sure. running planes out of gas. And that's when I finally told our guys, I said, no, we're not doing that anymore. Strictly close air support, strictly ticks. That's it. We're not doing this. And, you know, when the when the battle slows down and nobody's getting any, then, sure. you know, that, that would be a different story. But we started taking, uh, the guys were taking fire from um, Village. So uh, the yeah. first one was um, Marzak. And so uh, I called the Kayak because they, they told me, take out the Village. And I'm like, huh, uh, let me check on that first. Yeah. You know, so uh, sure enough, they said, hey, if, uh, if you're taking fire from it and the, the general, the ground commander declares it hostile, then you can destroy it. You can attack it. So I went over to the general and I said, hey, sir, um, and I, I got the words, declare it hostile out. And he goes, it's hostile. So we set it up and, and we, you know, I, I, it was weird feeling because I felt like, if, you know, no, no real comparison, but being a bomber guy, I'm feeling like this is like World War II, you know, we're bombing a town We're we're, yeah. you know, no, no target, but there's, there's a place where people live and we're dropping bombs on it. And that continued with, uh, Shirk and Kale and, um, Baba Keel were the other, uh, two villages there. And eventually we destroyed them. I mean, just obliterated them and turned them into uh, dump targets, um, uh, because uh, we were having a problem after a while. This is where, you know, I got my dauber up because I was pissed about uh, what I saw with the Roberts Ridge. And then, um, you know, the army just screaming at us about, uh, you know, targets that were silly. And 
you know, so then um, we couldn't send uh, naval aircraft back to the carrier with bombs. They, they would have to right. dump them in the ocean. So we're wasting them. So we created a, a dump target, which is not a, a approved term, a bomber box, which is not an approved term. Right. So we, we eventually called it a special engagement zone and we put it on the rat lines. That's where the enemy was ex filling. So we would, okay. if we had extra munitions, we drop it on there. So now I'm walking around the talk, like, what do you got? You know, I'm, cause I'm, I'm <laughs> kind of pissed. And we're, yeah, yeah. I think another big factor that I think was a key to, to, you know, the, the, the 130 or the AC-130 thing, again, it's probably not fair, but I'm going to take it out of here for a second. But I think what we did as airmen was uh, noteworthy because not, it's more than noteworthy, but 1100 and uh, I think it's 1150 soldiers air assaulted in and 1150 air assaulted out. You know, we had nice. none were killed. All our guys were, were uh, survived and we killed like a thousand enemy and yeah. it was air power. You know, there weren't a lot of guys shooting guys with M4s. There was some of that, but it was air support, you know. So yeah. um, so now I'm, I'm kind Which of optimal. That's like that's like the what you want. That's the best case scenario for us. Yeah, absolutely. hundred sure. percent. And yeah. The, the funny, uh, there, there, again, there's lots of funny stories, but, um, and again, that I think you and I might think it's funny, but you know, maybe yeah. some people don't, but, uh, the ironic, uh, some, some of it is for instance, yeah, yeah. uh, you, you know, we were dropping, um, wick mid, so CBU one Oh threes and mm -hmm. on the ridge line, the whale that we were going to go assault. And it had a 5% dud rate. So I kept telling them, I said, that's like putting like 5% of, we've just dropped, each munition has 600 submunitions in it. We just dropped like, a, I don't know, like three or 400 of them. So do the math. That's like yeah. having like 3,000 hand grenades. Uh, just laying about. Yeah, laying about on, yeah. on the top of, of that ridge line. It's like, oh. Then they were asking for napalm. And I said, well, we don't have any of that right now <laughs> uh, because we was, they were dug in and they had bunkers, yeah. and, you know, so they just wanted to just take them, take them out, you know? So I, as a B-52 guy, that that's a bomber. And then the B-1 is uh, something else, you know, that's a derogatory yeah, yeah. phrase. Um, <laughs> but I, I absolutely changed my tune uh, because the B-1 came in, they had, uh penetrator air burst and surface burst and they had all three bomb bays full and it was i mean it was off they couldn't loiter very long but to have yeah. that that combo platter was incredible and awesome and nice. they were very responsive so i i really grew to appreciate them also during that that period of time i controlled aircraft i never thought i'd control uh f-14 uh, TARS. Nice. I don't even know what that is, you know, but it could drop bombs. <laughs> uh, right. All the, the French, the Super A-10 Dard, the Mirage 2000. Um, uh, there were some British aircraft, um, you know, stuff that's not even in, in the inventory anymore. Um, yeah. But uh, so it went on for, uh, uh, it, it, let's see, 16 days was the the operation and it eventually uh really slowed down and they they were able to um get up on roberts ridge and and recover uh and then also do forensics around and detect all the foreign fighters and and uh i am absolutely leaving out probably about 80 percent of all of what really happened there but um that was the summary of anaconda um, and how it went. Uh, I think it was a, like I said, a testimony to it really may be an example for what air support can do in, sure. in an operation that our guys have to remember. Um, if we were doing some techno stuff and, you know, not as concerned about, uh, supporting the army, that would have been a different story. And, yeah. and, you know, again, the hair on the back of, 
uh, next needs to be listened to. You know, if we hadn't doubled the ATO, if we hadn't done things to ensure the nets were available to all our guys out there. And, uh, and that's not even talking about, you know, the heroics of, of our guys, uh, down right. in the, in the trenches, you know, what they were doing. Um, one of the uh, offshoots and, and again, the army just was uh, like a bad neighbor, you know, they just kept dumping their garbage in our yard and, and, uh, <laughs> they accused one of our guys of cowardice in the face of the enemy. And uh, I was directly involved in that. And so I had to go to the, the Pentagon and talk to uh, the Air Force, the half A3, and assure him that this was not a, a reality. And um, what happened was the guy was in the in the ship, you know, and he was um, when when Aki came back in, uh, he had two AK uh, rounds in the armor. He had gotten Jeez. blown up in the back and then he saved the day, you know, so, so th there's, yeah. there's a guy who did, uh, you know, Amazing. Yeah. yeoman's work. Yeah. Silver star, you know, right. Right. You know, and then, uh, you, you know, one of our guys who came back in did great work, uh, super guy. He just said, I'm not going back out there, which is exactly what I expect anybody to say. Yeah. <laughs> and, right. and the thing is that that army heard that. And th that's all he said. He says there was no argument. There was no fight. It, it yeah, just yeah. like, I'm not going back out there. Eh, okay. That's, that's, that's probably what I would say. It's just like, it's a logical thing to say yes. after being in that kind of an environment for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And he, yeah. he was never told to, I never ordered him to go back out there. And I, I sent uh, other folks cause it was the, a you know, everybody was spent and, there was right. no issue. So I just told them the, the, the air force that, that, that is not an issue. And everybody performed brilliantly, bravely, and they should all be commended. You know, it yeah. should be a, a unit citation is what I told them, right. you know, for, for all of what they did. So, uh, you, you know, the, the army, I think in the midst of it, like, again, I forgot <laughs> this part, but, uh, all the stuff is as hot as it is. Um, the, the fist court was great. Um, he went mm -hmm. on to become a general, uh, the, uh, deputy, uh, G three was great. He went on to become a three star. They were very supportive. So the, the fires guy, uh, comes in, um, and he shows me a draft of a letter they're writing to the air force, the, to the Pentagon telling them that the air force is failing to provide close air support. And I'm, I'm like looking at this thing, just like trembling with anger. Like this is during the battle. During the or battle. After the battle. It's like, like this is still going on. It's, it's like, like what they do. They you do. have time to like draft this letter. Oh yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's like, you could have had to be so frustrating for you. Oh, it was, but you know, that the, the same in grace is that we succeeded. And again, the guys did brilliant. And, uh, yeah. Um, you know, if it was, you brought all their guys home. Yeah. And I think, I think at, at the, the, the apex, when there was that realization that without air power, this had, would have gone south so fast that, yeah. that I saw a glint of a change of attitude. Um, okay. the, the chief of staff was, he brought a stopwatch and he would say, hit that truck. And he would click the watch. He goes, okay, air force, I'm going to see how long it takes you to get us close air support. And I was like, how many times I got to tell you that's not close air support, <laughs> you know, maybe it's battlefield interdiction it's a game to this guy or what, man. I mean, this, that doesn't even make sense, no. but you know, they all it's got real life, Oh, man. and uh, general Harrell, uh, from Mogadishu fame. He was yeah. there. He was, he was oh, a good okay. guy. Uh, general Jones, he was a, a soft general army side. So they were the two DCGs and they'd come over and they go, okay, Pete, what can you do to hit that truck? <laughs> And, and I would just say, hey, sir, you understand? And they go, yeah, we get it. We get it. And, and, you know, they, yeah, what was the deal with the truck? I mean, there, there you had, you had actively, you had people engaged in combat and like, yeah, I got, that's a resupply truck, but <clears throat> let's just eliminate the threat first. And then we'll start going at the logistics. I mean, that's weird. Yeah. Well, and I'm sure that, that this story is, I mean, the, the, the story of Anaconda is, is unique, but the experiences of, of frustration like that are not unique. It's no, but I, th I take pride in that. 
I, I say, you know, like, uh, one of the things that, that as a, again, as a commander that I always watched for was if, uh, especially ALOs, you know, like if an ALO came in as an aviator, it, it's easy to, to, to get enamored with and go native and, and yeah. feel like, you know, you'll do anything for the army instead of no, 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 you're, you're an airman and you're supposed to be representing the equities of the air component. And you can be friends, you can have barbecues, you know, be best buddies, you know, whatever with the army. That's wonderful. You're comrades. That's great. But you cannot do that thing where you compromise your mission, your duty to just be one of the guys on, on the Well, inside. I don't. And frankly, from the being, having been I did some conventional, not during the war, but like most of it was soft. The army, the guys I worked with, they weren't expecting they would, they expected us to, you know, do what they did and live like they did. And which I, we would do for sure. But they also were like, Hey, don't forget you're the, you're the air force guy. You know, you need to make sure that you bring the air power that you, we expect you to bring, you know, they, you know, they, they also expect that part of it. You know what I mean? They, they don't expect you like kind of like to your point, they, they should expect you to be who you are, not, not exactly, not just fall in line with them and do whatever they do. You know, they, you, you have to have your own identity, in order to bring that 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 air to bear to help those guys out, you know, you're there to protect them against an enemy that they can't fight themselves, right? So that's that's the whole point of an Air Force guy being there. Well, so if you're just falling in line and doing kind of what they do, especially on the conventional side, then you're kind of, um, I don't know, you're like doing them a disservice, I guess. When you say, a hundred percent, and and I yeah. I would hope that with your uh, vast experience in soft that you would have seen that a little bit less because typically, you know, soft is small unit and you depend yeah. on uh firepower like that where you can't carry it with you. Like, um, right. You know, one of the big issues with, uh, 10th mountain was, um, you know, they didn't bring any artillery, uh, that I think they had the biggest mortar they had was a 60, uh, they, brought in the uh, Apaches um, mm -hmm. and they got chewed up. They had eight of them and uh, seven of them or nine of them. They, and eight of them were uh, non-mission capable after day wow. one. One had a wow. RPG sticking in the windshield that didn't go off. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so I, it, it was just, you know, in retrospect, it is, it is a little shocking that, that, that it, they were that like persnickety in the middle of getting what I thought was, was awesome air support. Yeah, you were, you were getting, you were supporting them perfectly well. Yeah. yeah it, like to your point, like the soft side and the conventional side are, I think are a lot different. There's a lot a different, like you said, different dynamic, different mentality. Um, uh, number one, and I can't really speak to SF that much um, just from what I've heard from guys, but like with the Rangers, I can speak very well about, we were, um, we didn't get any of that stuff from those guys. We were, you know, we were very ingrained with them and we were, we lived with them. We did everything with them. So there wasn't, there wasn't really any animosity or any, uh, anything like that. But I, I have in the past experienced some conventional, like when I was an airman and stuff like that, you experienced some of that animosity from the army just cause you're the air force guy and you, and you have to prove yourself and you have to, you know, you know, prove to them that you're not some knucklehead, you know, blue suitor or whatever, but, yeah, it's it can be frustrating for sure. Yeah, and yeah, you, I, I can't. And that, again, like you said, I don't mean. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but that, I cannot. It just doesn't even make sense to me for that guy to like hit that stopwatch or write that letter. I'm like, what? Like, or where is your focus? Like, where are you? There's there's war a war going on. You know, I don't know. Yeah, it seems and it wasn't the it wasn't the last time that that would happen. And uh, yeah, it's you know, and they throw the oh, you don't you know, you don't want to be part of the team and. Well, you know, I think saving lives with close air support is pretty much being part of the team. Yeah, hundred percent. And we're not, we're not manned. Um, you know, I know we're getting into details and stuff, but I we're not manned to do a lot of the things at all of what they do. Sure. You know, we can't, right. you know, clean the trains and stuff because we're men manned to provide close air support. Period. Right. You know, or liaison. You know, if if you want. Uh, you can, I can go to your targeting board or I can go clean the 
a dream. Yeah, I mean, your guys are, like you said, the the Tech P is part of the commander's staff. I mean, that's his, I think it's just maybe, maybe a lack of understanding of who you guys are, which kind of, that's the way it was back then, though. I mean, they, they, there was no, there's a real lack of understanding of the, the gravity that a Tech P can bring to a, the fight. You know, they're just like, well, you're just these Air Force attachments, and, you know, you're not really... Oh, we got a couple more bodies to serve Chow. It's like no, that's not why they're there. Yeah. You know, that's not the whole. Uh, yeah. I, I would say that uh, we we came back, and uh, I think it was a since it was the first conventional engagement, uh, we got a, a lot of attention, and the Air Force put together a, a thing called Task Force Enduring Look, and we got interviewed, and it was all to gather lessons learned, not not really realizing what was to come. You know, like we were wow. going to get down with uh, a more conventional peer like entity with Iraq and and the fight would go on for so much longer. So it was interesting coming home, um, you know, for again, living in, in the area, being stationed up at Fort Drum. When I came home, uh, we went to Manhattan and everybody was waiting for somebody to thank for going and getting some revenge. So we got hooked up at the plaza. You know, it was just a really nice experience. People just kept saying, thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, that was not an isolated incident. Everybody who did, did for a while until it became, yeah. you know, like, okay, we're keep, we keep rotating, we're going over again and again. So it was a very unique period of time. But as soon as that was over, and again, I'm, I, apologize because there's there's a lot of in, really uh impactful incidents that occurred within there but i realize i'm talking for a, so much so long already <laughs> it's okay but uh <laughs> the um uh the minute we got out i got uh rolled back into kuwait uh colonel longoria pulls me and uh two other uh guys aside and says we're going to get ready to plan to go invade Iraq. So we're like hours out of Anaconda and um, now we're going to go plan Iraq. Get that word, go home, you know, uh, kind of hit the reset button. But then immediately uh, we go build what would become the 484th Air Expeditionary or Air Ground Expeditionary Wing. Um, mm -hmm. And that was... Uh, General Longoria commanded it during uh, the invasion of Iraq. Um, for Iraq, um, we did all the planning and there was issues as as we saw, you know, when the thing kicked off, we had comms issues with the ASOC mm -hmm. and uh, Fifth uh, Corps was the main, um, the lead army element. And uh, uh, so fourth ASOG was doing the bulk of the planning and they, they were the lead to, to run the ASOC and the ASOG. So, uh, General Longoria, um, was concerned because he was getting, you know, maybe what I would call some pushback and, and lack of acknowledgement that, that he was the boss. General Mosley yeah. made him the air ground boss for the whole operation, but the wing kept kind of pushing back a little bit. So um, when things started to feel like they were needed some attention, uh, me or General Longoria, or sorry, Colonel Longoria, myself and Chief Voigt flew out to uh, uh, Camp Virginia and uh, we engaged. It was uh, funny because <laughs> there was a, you know, those little um, grammar school desks you know, that you sit at <laughs> with the little right, desk right. in front of you. That's what I was sitting in. And uh, <laughs> he went in, in the back room with uh, the Colonel, um, shoot, slips my name, but um, Curry, Colonel Curry. And uh, so they were having it out in there. And I think it was to the gist of, look, I'm the boss. I'm concerned about some of this stuff and you work for me kind of thing. Right. And then uh, his... Um, air boss, they called him the deputy. He took him. It was a, a lieutenant colonel and he took him and he took him back to the Kayak to teach him. We're getting ready to, to cross the LD. So he left me there. He said, now you're working in the ASOC. And okay, well, you know, I was going to say I had no ASOC experience. I guess I would say Anaconda was ASOC-y 
So, um, I, um, said, all right. And that's what am I supposed to do? (laughs) You know, what role do I have? Cause I don't work for these guys. So they, there was a lot of, you know, they looked at me sideways. Why was I there? So my role in the, in the, um, ASOC was non contributory. I did nothing of any good to anybody, but I was there. Um, I, I kind of monitored things to see if there was anything I could do to help, but they had it wired. Uh, now the comms was messed up. They fixed it. Um, I think they did a, a great job, but, um, when we were getting ready to go, so I was with the TAC and, uh, the, um, the main was going to go separate. So we were loading up in a Chinook and, uh, we went to take off and they had put a bunch of mail in the, in the helicopter. And we went to take off and we didn't get, um, the enough airspeed and out or prop rotations. So we ran into the berm. So we kind of crashed on takeoff. Oh my God. <laughs> and, uh, I was like, well, this is a great start. And then, um, the, the guy, basically, we, I think we threw some bags out the back and he tried it again. And then we took, oh, off. is it too heavy? Yeah. Too heavy, way too heavy. <laughs> And, uh, so we're flying, yeah, uh, and, <laughs> and, uh, I'm looking down. So I go up, I get in the gunner's seat. Uh, so, no, sorry. The gunner's still, he's in his seat. And then I'm in the like IP seat where you, the instructor mm-hmm. pilot says, so I'm looking out yeah. the window and I, I can't see any, I'm an aviator, but I can't see any of the gauges cause they're, they're sitting in front of them and stuff. So I started looking out the window and you know, I, I don't know. I figure we're probably like 500 feet, you know, going in. And, uh, so I started looking down and I go, huh, that looks weird. And I look again and I see a Cobra that looks like the size of a school bus. And, you know, it's sitting there and I'm looking down at it. And I go, we're at 10 feet. <laughs> and, well, you mean an actual, co- I thought you meant like a Marine Cobra. You no, mean like a snake. A snake. Yeah. Cause I couldn't <laughs> make any, it was just dirt, you know, it was dirt and that, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it was like little palm, palm tree. I thought they were palm trees, but there's just little scrubby palms and rocks and <laughs> right, stuff. Right. And I, so I, you know, I, I don't know. I, I figure we're 500 <laughs> feet until I see this giant Cobra. <laughs> and Jeez. yeah, so I thought, okay, that's cool. We're going in low level. And, um, you know, yeah. so, uh, we, we've, fight our way up to, uh, uh, Baghdad. Um, I'll keep, like I said, I'll keep that short. They, 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 they did a fine job and, uh, we're getting ready to transition to, uh, um, sustainment ops, uh, pretty much all of the thunder run, all that kind of stuff's over. So Mm -hmm. I'm coming back from, um, visiting with, um, Aki and, um, a few of the other guys that that were in with uh third id uh that did obviously a great job shrop um uh, yeah, you know yeah. and uh we're walking back into the tent and i'm about three guys behind uh maybe maybe a little bit more and they have a, a bradley discharge they had a bradley um guarding the ecp and the gun went off and it just cut two guys in half and uh killed them like friendlies yeah yeah they were waiting in line to get through the ecp and oh my and God. the thing was you know had the gun barrel down and apparently the guy stepped on the trigger switch in the in the oh my God. vehicle yeah and the chief was there uh i think it was chief quinn um he he got really tore i mean he, i think he was standing right there when it oh happened and he got, he got real tore up. It's like, we, man, we just got through all of that and that happens. And those poor two Jeez. guys, you know, like, um, who knows what they went through and, and then they get killed like that. So oh then there was this big, you know, big thing about, um, uh, accidental discharges and then weapon status changed and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, but the AGAL, sorry, sorry, the um, the 484th was the precursor to the AGAL. So when we came home, okay. um, we we got back from that, and the uh, effort was to build the 93rd AGAL. So that was my job for a while. Then General Longoria said, um, uh, "You're going to uh, go to the 14th 
So I said, okay. And uh, I went to jump school and, uh, you know, jump schools, jump school. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they don't care who you are. It's got a little late in the game to be going to jump school, but good on you. No kidding. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, you've seen Apocalypse Now, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. remember the, the scene where Martin Sheen is... He's talking about Colonel Kurtz going through you know, yes. all that training. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and he was like, yeah. I don't know, 32 or 36 or something like that. And then Martin Sheen goes, uh, holy, you know, cow, I, I, I went through when I was 18 and it almost killed me or something. And I was yeah. like, so I said, ah, you know, Colonel Kurtz, what a pussy. I went through when I was yeah, right. 42 <laughs> or something. And, uh, you know, it was a little harder. I was a runner, yeah. you know, and, and played football my whole, whole career and everything. But uh, you do get older. I hate to say. Well, the thing, the thing about jump school is it, it's not inherently tough, like physically, it except the toll it takes on your body like there's a lot of falling and a lot of a lot of pounding you know the run is not like really it's really slow running so you're pounding your knees and it, it can take its toll on, on a body so yeah no i i agree well, and good on you the first time i jumped um it was out of uh 141 and uh oh okay. i hit the ground and i did the feet ass head and sure cracked my head and it it was like oh my god is this what it's like to to, uh, <laughs> to <laughs> like every day and then then yeah you know i'm like holy you know crap and then then next time i jumped was out of um i think it was a c17 and uh man i hit like a, i was landing on a pillow and i was like i just nailed it you know yeah. no skill of mine it was just luck you just never know. I know yeah. it's that's the thing about static line landings. It's you just whatever you get, and you know, depending on the wind and how you know, yeah, yeah. So I get I get through jump school. I go to the uh, 14th, and uh, I'm the DO. And uh, right off the bat, the uh, the commander um, uh, Pat Pope is downrange doing uh, Ramadi uh, with the 82nd. So okay. 82nd's in charge, and then I think it's first ID and uh, maybe first cav. Uh, on either side of the river and uh he's got a medical problem so he's got to come home and so i go immediately uh down range and i'm the ea sauce commander uh for 14th and so then you know of course i got a couple of um older dudes on either side that don't want to listen to me because hey we're we're all commanders back home and you know it's like okay that's yeah. wonderful but right now i'm in charge you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. not to be a, uh, you know, a jerk or anything, just like somebody has got to be in charge. Sure. Yeah. I mean, you know? it's, it's the way it is. It's the military yeah, after yeah. all. Yeah. So, uh, the, probably a couple of big things we, we got attacked, uh, quite frequently with, uh, rockets and, uh, mortars, RPGs, uh, and we got hit one time, uh, by a, um, suicide, uh, truck it was a bbid oh, man. came through the gate it was disguised i think as a either a fuel truck or a food truck and unfortunately uh one of the soldiers had to jump in the cab with the guy to escort him around and it was like the week before they put um barricades around jersey barriers around the, the chow hall they were aiming yeah. for the chow hall Oh. So uh, I guess the guy felt stymied, so he turned around, and I think he saw the talk, and uh, so he he blew it off um, between the talk and the chow hall. So um, we responded. Uh, I got air on station, um, and our guy. I went to check on our guys. Everybody's fine, you know. Um, I put the guy on the desk. I called in some A-10s and I said, hey, just just keep these guys overhead in case there's a like a follow up attack. You know, maybe this was just a precursor as I went to check on the guys I came back. Um, everything was fine. Uh, well, uh, so Ramadi was, you know, that was uh, interesting and uh, came back and um, led the 14th for a couple of years, which I absolutely love. Love those guys. Uh, a lot of great relationships that still continue with all my, you know, units, but sure. you know, something about the 14th and, uh, you know, that, that, well, 20th too. I, one thing I will say, and, and I, I hope that I can make this into a, uh, a feasible project, but 
in the window from 2001 till um, the invasion of Iraq, I don't think any unit had uh, a kind of recognition um, on it like the 20th did in that small window. We had an 85 man unit and there were five silver stars and yeah. I don't know how many bronze stars with valor. And it was serendipity. You know, the guys just kept ending up where the fight was. Right. And, uh, right. you know, it was significant. So I, I, and when they got that, there, they did the job, which is what I love about it. Like they were just stellar troops, just stellar guys for sure. Yeah. And, and it was again, a unique moment in history for yeah. the, for that, for that, uh, unit. Um, when I, and I then became, uh, no, actually, I had another deployment um, to um, Afghanistan. I went to um, Camp Salerno okay. and uh, one of my guys had told me months before, he said that, you know, we were going, um, you know, rapid fire all the time. We were gone. Uh, I, I was doing less than one to one rotation. I'd come home for a couple months, go for six, eight months. Yeah. Um, and so one of the guys wanted to get married in October. So sure enough, his number came up and it was his turn to go, turn to go. So I went in his place. So I just went as a JTAC, um, you know, as nice. a re really as a brigade ALO, but it was yeah. an interesting um, operation. Uh, it was out in, um, with, uh, at, at Salerno with first brigade and, they had uh, two, three Marines under them as a battalion. So we did two operations with them. And I was the senior ALO that went with that battalion. And it was, in, you know, it was great. And I, yeah. I love the Marines. We're out in the middle of nowhere. And it was uh, whatever the date of the Marine birthday is, I think like November 10th or something. Yeah. And uh, we, we're in the middle of nowhere and we're fighting with these guys. And they're like, this is not for you. And there was, there was like three of us Air Force guys. <laughs> <laughs> so they just wanted to make sure we were not involved in the birthday celebration. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. This is for Marines. And it's like, okay, we get it. You yeah, know. fine. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, fine. We'll sounds, stand over here. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, we did they're this, adamant uh, about that stuff, man. Oh, yeah, sure. yeah. And and I, I love them for it because yeah. we don't have that kind of cocky air force attitude like no you it's, know. it's a little more laid back for us for sure yeah it's not yeah, nearly as yeah. intense as those guys <laughs> yeah well we uh we, we did this big operation and and uh um i just sum it up it was um we took over a, a police station in um what valley is it it became famous later uh as like the hot spot in Afghanistan slips my mind right now. Korengal. Korengal. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So uh um it went fine. You know, the the big deal was we had the Rangers were going to uh, the operation consisted of us assaulting a GAC, so a ground assault convoy into this area, take this police station. And then I set up on the roof uh and then we had the um, other JTACs out in the field with their companies. And we were uh, supposed to be uh, another kind of hand hammer and anvil thing where we were going to attack from this, this big body of land. And the, we were going to attack from the main body, main area. And then the Rangers were going to land assault on the, the point, And then they were going to push them into us. Well, in mid-flight, unbeknownst to us, uh, the Army commander out there, I forget his name, but he asked a question of his G3. The, the, I mean, the Chinooks are in flight. The Rangers are, are going. Mm -hmm. And he says, do we have an interpreter on the aircraft? And the answer was no. So he had made an edict that said all missions need to include an interpreter. So they aborted. So... Oh, no. We didn't know that. Oh, so we no. we started continuing with our activity. And uh, this is this is kind of a again, a, you know, I mean, this it happened. So but it's it's not a great story. But um, so we're taking fire 
from uh, indirect fire. And I have a, a pair of A-10s that are orbiting over um, the area where the Marines, where we are. Okay. And uh, so uh, I had a predator. So I saw a target and I didn't see like people, but this is where the fire was coming from. So I cleared the aircraft hot and the pilot is now a famous politician. So I'm, I'll refrain from naming them. Okay. Uh, um, they laughed on the radio and I was like, uh, say again. And they said, we're, we're not, we don't drop on nothing. Um, I, what, what do you, uh, you know, what are you telling us to do kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. But I got indirect fire coming from this location. Uh, again, you're cleared hot to these coordinates, whatever I gave them. I think I even had, um, you know, so they didn't drop, uh, took fire, Marine died. So got me, you know, very upset. Sure. Uh, and, uh, then all of a sudden it was like, okay, we're taking casualties. And they, they, they said, okay, just give me a spot or something. Give me a laser. So I had to lay the uh, predator lays the target, you know, now it was, it was in an orbit. So at the time that I first cleared, that wasn't available. Then it was, and you know, blah, yeah. but anyway, um, so they said, uh, I guess after it was all over, I'm going to come back, but when it was all over, I went to the uh, location where the A-10s were stationed in Bagram and I sought out the, the individual and I said, you know, what's the deal? And they said, oh, it's just a cultural difference. We don't shoot at stuff we can't see. I said, we do that all the time. <laughs> you know, we drop yeah. through the world and all Final weather. coordinate, yeah. 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 <laughs> so anyway, uh, it, it ended okay, but I think it was more of an education for them than for for me, but um, it was very disappointing because I had a similar situation happen later. Um, but in this this foray, I think that this is a, an exception with this deployment. The brigade commander had gone to Air War College, so he loved and appreciated the Air Force okay. because he understood it. Yeah. And when it came time to me telling him I can do something or I can't do something, he, he trusted me because Good. he understood what the air force was all about. So that was great. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it was, uh, um, interesting too, because, you know, you mentioned late in life. So at one of these times we, we were sent on this mission up to the border of, you know, that little point of Afghanistan that sticks out there in the China. Yeah. 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 We were going all the way up there <laughs> and, uh, nobody had been there before, like not in a long time, but the Russians were, and they had built a ski resort there. So yes. we, we go up there and we're kind of like risking our lives, you know, uh, to do it. And we find out that there's a guy who lives up there that used to live in Virginia that now lives in Afghanistan that wants to open a ski resort. So we were supposed to go up there and broker a deal with the local, uh, you know, leadership the the chief or whatever to uh get land deeds or something like that what yeah it was dumb so <laughs> <laughs> and then that we were, we were supposed to so this meeting's going on and there's these big wigs in there and stuff and and uh the marines were going to send a patrol to go up to the top of the ridge to because we see people up there yeah so i told i thought man you know i, I kind of thought to myself i go okay i got um um, Dave Mattiford was the guy and there was another, uh, JTAC with him. And I said, you know, these guys have been working hard. So I said, you stay here. I'll go with the patrol <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> uh, just, just relax, have some water, but you know, you're, you're also part of security here. Yeah. So I go out there and we're up there at like a gazillion feet All right. and he, you know, these kids, no kidding kids like 18 year olds like this tall carrying a saw just chugging you know yeah. jogging 
and going up the mountain and, and I'm in this formation and I'm like, you know, okay, like, let's what see. Did I do? Yeah. My, is, is it going to be my lungs and my heart <laughs> and my head? What? And I was, you know, I was in good, I was okay shape, but I'm like, you know, Still, twice though, their know. age, yeah, you yeah. know? So I'm, I'm chugging along and I'm like, Hey, I need to do a radio check. <laughs> you know, let's, let's take a knee here real quick. And he said, no, we got to keep moving. I go, no, I really got to check in. No, so I, I, yeah, you, yeah, you don't understand. Uh, so luckily right after that, the thing wrapped up and they were like, okay, let's go back. And oh, yeah. if we had gone all the way to the top, I honestly, I would have either had a, been a big old baby and taken a knee or something <laughs> or just jumped off the cliff. And that's a testament to like the young uh, American soldier. I mean, those guys, you know, the infantrymen is is uh, just a force to be reckoned with because they're just go go go, and they just have that mentality. Yeah. Yeah, I I just uh, hope that uh, and and not to you know I certainly don't want to bring uh, politics into it, but I think our focus is moving away from that right now, and I'm yeah. concerned because what matters is that you know the right. grit, the courage, the training um you know can you use a weapon how do you use how do you protect your buddy can you do buddy care all mm -hmm. of the good stuff you know all this other yeah. stuff is a non it's a distraction this this it should is. be you know uh, um citizen 101 stuff and right. and you get that before you become a, a soldier and i think the thing that i think is the um military used to be a beacon for society we were right. elite and and uh different in a good way and mm -hmm. we don't want to be a reflection of society for sure so, yeah for they, sure. but that's what they want us to be is yeah. like we need to be represented across the board we need to identify all of these these very uniquenesses of individual people it's yeah. like no 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 that's why we wear uniforms right we are yeah. all the same regardless of who you are what your background is we are the same you're a uniform you're an american soldier you're american airman etc and yep. and it's it's disturbing you know it's worrisome well, well like you were saying i mean it's 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 not about it, we we've, we've lost focus on what's important and i remember when i was an airman I, I wasn't allowed to have feelings i wasn't allowed to have you know uh you know i couldn't complain about stuff or I could, you know, and I'm not saying that we should go back to the time where kids were getting hurt or anything, but there's a time and a place for complaints or for not wanting to do something or being different. But in, on the battlefield, that is not the place. I mean, the, the whole point of the military, the whole point of us in this business is to, you know, engage with and defeat the enemy, not get killed by the enemy. So if we're not focused on that, then we're we are doing our guys a disservice i think for sure yeah and uh did you do uh time in the 14th uh no i never did no. so what was your uh like your first unit what what so my, ASOS? my i was I actually got really kind of lucky because um uh ray carvalho hooked me up when i came out of tech school he gave me a, he got me a slot to um davis monthan and we were pulling rotations because according to the treaty for just cause you can only have so many people down in Panama. So the unit that supported the Panamanian mission with the first, the 508th and the 50, 87th, uh, we were all stationed at Davis Monthan. It was me. Like my bought my first boss was like our first NCIC was Jimmy Felton. Um, Keith Ingram was there, Eric Harris, you know, guys like that. And, um, so we would, we'd go TDY to Panama, like for three or four months at a time and, you know, work in the jungle and stuff. So, like Keith Ingram was my direct supervisor. He was prior 275 Ranger Tag P, and I think he worked at 175 also. So, I, it, at the from the very beginning of my career, it was ingrained in me about that kind of that yeah Ranger mentality, but also just how to be. You know, I was always doing push-ups. You know, I was always you know <laughs> running. I was it was it was a more of um, a combat oriented type of uh, upbringing, I guess. So, yeah. And I think you, you, and the 14th, like to your point, the 14th is like, that's the, the way they are too. That's a, that also a good example of that kind of mentality for sure. Yeah. yeah and, and the one thing uh, I, I think I <clears throat> would probably guess occurred also for you, but there was a, um, a, a level of good natured, um, I would say, I'll just say the word hazing, um, oh, for sure, you yeah. know, and there was uh, rituals and traditions within the mm -hmm. unit and it and it did nothing but build pride. 
Nobody yeah. was um, embarrassed or denigrated. It was hard and it was, um, you know, it was something to just get through. And then once you were, then you're, you're on the team, you know, not, right. you know, again, I don't want to make it sound like it was an uh, eliminating thing, but you know, like guys got rolled and, and, uh, that, that, that was just part of being accepted into the unit is that yeah. they felt that you could be, um, subjected to a little rough housing and, All right. you know, not, not go cry into, to your Congressman or something, you know? Yeah. So I, and, and like, what are you going to do? Like, so, you know, a, a couple of guys jump you and put and tape you up for a little bit. Like, have you ever like that compared to being in a situation that say like Matt Aki was in or, you know, Mike Shropshire that those are, you know, that's nothing compared to what those guys had to endure, you know, getting blown up and shot. And so, so if you're, if you are not able to kind of take a little good natured, you know, hazing, I guess, or whatever, uh, then where are you, how are you going to survive on the battlefield? I don't know. It's, it's kind yeah. of, it's kind of the, the mentality, you know? Yeah. And it's, again, uh, I think it, uh, it's about camaraderie and if, uh, for sure. hundred yeah, percent. Yeah. 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 So, well, I, uh, I, I think I went through, um, the, the couple things I want to just finish with is, um, I became the 18th ASOG deputy and um that was a great assignment and one of the good things that happened for me was um i got promoted obviously uh to take over the do and the command position of um the 14th i got promoted above the zone to lieutenant colonel so that's pretty cool but that was strictly 100 percent um the work of my supervisors and mm -hmm. and superiors that that made up for some of the deficiencies of previous supervisors. You know, I yeah. was not I didn't become a, a better airman or anything like that. I was me uh, the whole time. It was just sure. I happened to run into a couple situations. You know, I, I did take a little bit of the blame, uh, as was stated by my general officer superior at the academy for the Fairchild incident. Um, being on the crew and stuff like that. So, but I got promoted. And then um, when um, I got promoted below the zone to Colonel, and I don't think that's happened very often. And yeah. uh, <laughs> that is a hundred percent General Longoria um, in setting me up, taking care of me. You know, there, there's, um, there was no like, you know, divine intervention, but, he helped help me out, you know, to where not even it's, that's such an in, insufficient way to put it. Yeah, I know. What you um, mean, yeah. Yeah. He took care of me. And I think because he did, he felt like he was taking care of the airmen under me and, sure. and that that's the way it works because we've promoted um, guys who don't do that. And then it mm -hmm. comes back and, and we regret it, you know, that it right. does, does happen. But I got, um, so what happened, which was also pretty cool, was um, both times uh, for Iraq, when I got promoted to lieutenant colonel, I got deployed and General or Colonel Longoria told me, um, you can't go in there as a major and then two days from now, pin on lieutenant colonel. All right. So I took black magic marker with my desert <laughs> and I filled in my... Uh, because he told me to, he said, you're going to be a lieutenant colonel in like three days. Just, yeah, yeah. just put your, um, you know, uh, your rank. So I didn't have any rank. So I just colored it in black uh, on the DCUs. Uh, right. So that was lieutenant colonel. I kind of got frocked. And then for yeah. colonel, um, I got tasked to be the EA SOG commander. And it wasn't time for me to pin on yet. So I got frocked. And I went down down range as an 06 to uh, support the 18th Airborne Corps. So okay. th this I'll, I'll try to keep this brief. I know that's probably uh, not believable <laughs> at this point. No, please. <laughs> but no, uh, it's okay. Uh, so this was a this was a really uh, great assignment uh, for a couple reasons. Um, the 18th Airborne Corps is a go get them uh, organization, you know, For so sure. as is the 82nd, but 18th, uh, general Austin was the, uh, CG 
So I meet him. He's, he takes over for uh, General, um, oh, shoot, I forget, but he was a good, good guy. General Lawson comes in. So the rotation for us is different. So third Corps is out there right now, and they got another three or four months to go. So I'm going to go be General Odierno's um, ALO for three or four months, and then General Lawson's going to come over. I'm going to be his ALO for six months or okay. whatever. Yeah. So I meet General Austin, and we talk, and he seems like a great guy and seems like he appreciate us. So I go over, and I, I um, work with um, – uh, General uh, Odierno, and there was a lot of a lot of stuff going on at that point. This is the surge, okay. uh, so we we have a lot of um, action, and uh, um, eventually uh, General um, Austin comes over. 18th comes, so now they want to get in it. So the first thing that that he does is uh, first of all he gets there and and in the palace he. Uh, sees me in the reception line. And then when I go up to shake it, shake his hand, he goes, ah, there's my ALO. Uh, and he was like genuinely glad to see me. Nice. And that felt really good. You know, yeah. so a couple of staff meetings later, um, the fist cord comes down. He says, uh, General uh, Austin wants you to go with the TAC to uh, take Basra uh, back. Um, so I go, okay. <laughs> that sounds good. Yeah. And uh, he sends. You've been there. You've done that. You're ready. Yeah. Yeah. So he, he <laughs> sends his uh, CG or DCG, um, General Flynn, uh, Marine two star, uh, great guy. Mm -hmm. So he's going to lead the effort. And then there's a 06 Army dude, a uh, fires guy who's going to be the kind of like the chief of staff. So uh, we get together and I do a bunch of planning and stuff. I got. Um, Chief uh, Voigt, uh, Losher, and Valella in okay. the mix. They're out there somewhere. Um, Valella's my chief. Oh, sorry. Uh, Voigt's my chief. And then we're going to... So what I decide to do is... I don't know how long this battle's going to last. So I'm going to bring Voigt with me first. And then uh, I take a slice of the ASOC. Uh, and then I call um, MNF West. And the Marines are kind of idling right now. So I said, Hey, can I have, um, um, your desk? And they said, well, you could take some of it. So mm -hmm. I took the, what's called an ACE, a air, uh, air support command or element, whatever it was, you know, the Marine thing. So, yep. uh, so I got those two things. So I'm going to, um, mate those together. I set up a high DAX over Basra and we're fighting with the Brits. The Brits are down there. They got, um, um, S one hundreds. They're like one five fives. Okay. Uh, Self propelled guns. Uh, we got aviation. Um, and then we're using. They called them the MIT teams at the time, and they're military transition teams. Okay. So those are elements that are um, gonna mate with the Iraqis. And then there's like Iraqi three Iraqi divisions. So they deploy. Where we all go down there. And we set up for uh, this battle. And what had happened was the British had gotten uh, pinned down in the airport. So that was the only way in and out was the airport. They had tried to take back the city and they, they sent some chieftains downtown. They got schwacked. Um, they lost a bunch of guys. They tried backing out and it was a mess. So they're holed up in the airport. So uh, we get in there and the general is... Um, He's a great guy. He uh, kind of took me. He we had a, a little meeting in the in the room, and he goes, "Okay." He looks at me. He goes, "What do you got?" And I told him, "I I got this. I got that. I got this, that, that, and we're gonna do this. I got the high decks, and we're gonna flow." I talked to the uh, aircraft carrier. We're gonna use their their aircraft in addition to what we got land based, and and I said we got a twenty four seven flow, and he's like. I said, sir, that's all I got. And he goes, wow, that's enough. He goes, that, that's awesome. <laughs> Plenty, man. Yeah. yeah. So he, he would eventually, and I think this might be unprecedented also, but he would eventually give me, gave me his com ground commander's authority to strike targets. Wow. So I didn't have to ask him. I just saw it and he tasked me to take out all the indirect fire 
units around the city. And uh, so we commenced to do that. Um, and then we, we had, you know, I, I get more details and stuff, but we had an incident. So I'm doing this. He, he's uh, signed off uh, for the moment and I'm in the talk and we're uh, taking fire and we've taken casualties already and it's a mortar. And so I got a, a predator that's I'm looking at it and I yeah. can see the mortar team. And it's unfortunately, it's a um, husband, wife and kid Jeez. and the kids carrying rounds uh, dad's aiming and mom's hanging. And I, it's like, okay, but they are real rounds coming at us. Yeah, now yeah. I don't, I, I'm not, I'm not, I don't care about, I don't know this yet. I don't know this yet. Sorry. I don't, I see people. Sure. So, um, uh, we're taking rounds. So I direct the pred or sorry, that was, um, yeah, the predator to shoot, kill it with a hellfire. Mm -hmm. And, uh, there's, silence and i direct it again and there's silence and then it's on the you know now over chat and i what you know what's the deal and i think i got a jtac in between me and them you know working the the radio and stuff and and uh they said well we saw a kid and same thing sure enough round comes in kills uh brit uh soldier guy who didn't have to die um, and the family that they, they, uh, dispersed, uh, apparently during the orbit, they heard, they, they dispersed. So, you know, I think we hit the tube, but, uh, the family did not get killed and the Brit did. So there was a whole discussion after this, like whose responsibility is it to, you know, so it was, it was a very disturbing event, you know? Yeah. And, uh, you know, this thing went on for 30 days and um, the almost every night, the general, myself, that colonel and a PSD would fly into the city where the Iraqi army was set up and there was a general there. So the first night we get there, we fly in and we were taking rockets from uh, I don't know if they were RPGs or rockets, but it was ground fire mm -hmm. and had one, the doors open, you know, we're flying a Black Hawk and the rocket goes between the cabin and the skid and just like, Oh my God, just missed, you know, and there, it was, it was, uh, exciting to say, yeah. <laughs> to say the least. And uh, we do that every yeah. night we land in there and then we go down into this dungeon and it was dark and dank and there was candles flickering and you'd see all these Iraqi soldiers just lying in the bunker because we're taking fire and they're yeah. hiding in there and we're heading to where the general's at to have this meeting. So we're and uh, a couple of times later I go and I have the same experience, somewhat like almost like in Apocalypse Now when. They're in a bunker and a guy's shining a flashlight in the different faces. So yeah. I see one of our uh, warrant officers faces and he's doing the targeting for the Iraqis. And he looks at me and he goes, Colonel, get me out of here. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> you know, I just wanted to see him like running across the river with his suitcase, you know, trying yeah, to no doubt. look out. <laughs> but we get up into this meeting with this, this Iraqi general and there's an interpreter and uh, our general, General Flynn, is kind of pointing to people and he, he points to me and the Iraqi general gets, he, he, otherwise he's shaking hands, nodding and stuff. And then uh, the Iraqi general, here's General Flynn introduce me and he gets all animated and the interpreter goes, he goes, oh, uh, the general says, you're the one we're cheering for. And he says, you're the, you're the guy who brings the, you know, he, he said it in Iraqi way, but you know, you're yeah, the yeah. guy who's bringing the heat, you know, like, um, and he was like double shaking my hand and, and nice. all that kind of stuff. I'm like, yeah, airport. <laughs> That's right. He knows. <laughs> yeah. You got it. You got it. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so we, we did that and it was, uh, it was quite the, Lesson two, you know, like when, sometimes I, I try to explain people how you can use the ASOC 
in a non-traditional way and that you always need to be prepared to employ attack because that's the only way we're going to survive. And sure. in, at the core level, you can use attack for limited scope, limited duration operations, just like that. And you mm -hmm. set up airspace for yourself and you got attack P can manage it. You know, you don't need all this whiz bang stuff. You, you can, you can make that happen. And at the end of the 30 days, I think we killed uh, about 80 different indirect fire positions. Uh, we took the nice. city back. Um, all of that part was done by the MIT teams and the Iraqis. Um, and then the, you know, the Brits really appreciated uh, what we had to offer. Um, and they used the, you know, a couple times the, um, um, I'm getting, probably getting the name wrong, but it's their, their um, self-propelled 155s. Okay. Uh, was supposedly a pretty good system. And um, uh, so at the end of that, that was called Charge of the Knights was the name of the operation. And uh, I don't see ever see anything about it, but it was kind of a big deal. And I felt really yeah. good about it. But that's, that's a testament to how much, number one, you impressed him. And number two, how much confidence he had in you to let you kind of take charge of that stuff. I mean, he, you, you obviously came in and presented him with a, you know, with confidence and, you know, with expertise. And he was like, all right, I, I'm just, this guy's got it. You got it. And, uh, you know, he trusted you to, to do the right thing for him. You know, that's great. That's yeah. Awesome. I, well, I appreciate that. And I think that hopefully it's true. And I think that that is the, the formula for success in the future is that you, you, uh, get the army to trust you and deliver. You know, if you if you get them to trust you and you don't deliver, then you're never going to get that trust back. Right. Um, you know. And you're going to ruin it for the next guy because that whenever anytime that army, you know, how it is one Air Force guy screws up from an army guy and every Air Force guy after that has got to prove himself again. So, yeah, you've got to not only do you have to do it for yourself, but you got to do it for the guy behind you as well. So, yeah. 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 When I was deployed uh, in this capacity, um, we really kind of wrapped the surge up. We did Solder City after that. And I think it was the culmination really of Iraq. And after that, it all kind of started calming down. I came back, I finished my tour as the 18th commander and uh, General North, who was the CFAC and 9th Air Force commander at the time, asked me if I wanted to be the IG for the AC ACC deputy IG. Sorry. Okay. So I became the IG and that was kind of a, a good, a fun assignment. I met a lot of great people and it also kind of re me. Uh, sure. I, I was able to go to units I hadn't been to in years and maybe never been to and see how the Air Force actually operated in, the, in an evaluation way. Um, my boss uh, got relieved um, shortly after I got there. So I became the IG, which was unique. Um, Usually that's a one star position. So being an 06 in the seat gave me access to uh, at the ACC level, um, sitting down with the commander and, and the directors. I was a director uh, versus most guys or division chiefs at that point. Yeah. So that was pretty cool. And then they they finally hired a, a two star and then I became the deputy. <laughs> and so I got my demotion and uh, retired. Um, out of uh, Langley and then uh, uh, tried to do something different for a while, you know, sought out different things. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I think I, I might say I got called back and uh, what I'm currently doing now is hundred percent involved with the, the betterment of the community, the, the tactical air control uh, party, the uh, theater air control system, you know, so I think I'm still making a difference along those lines, which I'm, I'm happy about. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, we all have aspirations to do different things. I mean, I got, I kind of got pulled into the back into it as well. Um, but at, at the end of the day, that's what we know. And people are looking for that expertise, you know, to, to help out the military still. So I think guys that I commend guys that do different things, but, um, I also, I, I think it's easier just to have a guy that's already done that, that kind of work and it was good at it like you, uh, to just kind of fall back into it. And, you know, and I think that, I think your, your, that corporate knowledge you have of all those years is, it definitely pays off and definitely helps out the, you know, the effort. So, yeah. I, uh, okay. I think because if, if I was just, uh, 
trust me, if I was sitting in a cubicle farm and uh, filing papers or something, no, no way, no how, I right. wouldn't be doing it. But yeah. I lead a great team, um, you know, work with uh, great guys, Mark Hurst, uh, you know, Shrop. Um, I don't there's there's a bunch of names there, you know, General Longoria. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, you know, yeah, I knew you worked with Shrop. I didn't know you worked with Mark. That's cool. How's he, he doing? He's doing great. He's a, him in a while. He, he's a go getter. Yeah, um, he's awesome. Yeah, he's and a definite fire and forget kind of guy. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> for sure, for sure. Well, you um, you you did say that you were trying to do something else, I and mean, you kind of alluded to it earlier with that book. But you also have your own publishing company too. So, did you want to talk about that a, a little bit? I mean, I think it's very interesting. I I was on the website, and you sent me a couple of books, and but you also have like you also um, have other authors that are, that write like fiction and, uh, some other stuff. So yeah, please uh, tell, tell us a little bit about that. Well, the way it started was, um, the experience that I related with Anaconda, um, really was too much just to encapsulate in, in a, like a story or something. So I ended up writing a book and, um, I was writing the book. This is what it turned out to be is, uh, off we go. Okay. And um, I fictionalized it at the last minute. Uh, this is when we were still involved with, um, or we were involved with um, Black Rifle Coffee, A15 Publishing. Uh, we were all part of the same team. And at the, at the um, just before I published it, well, first of all, I started talking about it. And, and JT was, uh, J Jared Taylor was in my unit as an airman and we served downrange together and and um you know so we had a lot of overlap and mm. at that time you know maybe knew each other for 12 15 years or something and i told him about the book and i had tried to get it published uh through mainstream publishing etc and uh Nobody gives you an answer, um, yeah. you know, and, and it's very frustrating because today it's not like when, and, and I'm not making any kind of personal comparison, but, you know, when Hemingway Way wrote, you still had like printing presses and, right, and right. you know, there was very few writers out there that did it for a living. Now everybody writes and there's a gazillion mm -hmm. billion books, you know, Flood, so, the market's flooded, yeah. flooded, absolutely yeah. flooded. So uh, JT said, well, why don't we start a publishing company and you can run it? And I said, well, I don't know anything about running a publishing company. <laughs> and uh, so that was the birth of a one five publishing. And okay. its mission is to um, capture veteran stories and those don't have to be combat, but, you know, if it is, uh, in the case of off we go, that's really kind of like a encapsulation of the, uh, first response during the GWAT after nine 11 of, mm -hmm. of airmen that went out there and did it. And that's, it's a really a nod to the 20th ASOS and, and, um, the situation. Then, um, we published there. I was as a, um, I would, you know, you could say time capsule to capture, veteran stories that uh, maybe a veteran doesn't have enough to put into a book, but it's sure. a good story. So we capture it. And the impetus to that, I think I told you um, maybe even earlier hours ago <laughs> that uh, <laughs> yeah. my uncle's inspiration uh, and really the fact that he threw all that stuff in the garbage and burned yeah. it, you know, like it, that can't happen. A um, couple sad stories. I, I one um, veteran that's in there I was, uh, was a Marine, uh, 19 years old, and he hit uh, four beaches and lost his best childhood buddy at Iwo Jima. Wonderful guy, became a, a career uh, educator, um, but he was in my writing class in, um, here in Virginia. There was a veteran writing class and and he would always talk like he was he was from another era he, it was yeah. like watching a humphrey bogart movie you know like <laughs> hey kid what's the big deal <laughs> you know yeah. but great story he he unfortunately passed away uh a couple years ago and then i met another marine uh that he was one of i think there's less than 10 uh 
servicemen in the United States alive today that served in World War II, Vietnam, or Korea and Vietnam. Okay. And uh, I went to visit him twice. He lived in Philadelphia. And he was a, what a, what a, just a wonderful guy. He worked out like an hour and a half a day before he came down from his, uh, he lived upstairs in his, his house. And the, I, the first time I showed up was to record him on an interview like this. And he offers me a glass of bourbon. It was like nine 30 in the morning. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, you know, uh, sure, I guess. But his uh, his granddaughter wanted to publish the book for him, and uh, mm -hmm. his name was um, Leo, and and uh, Leo Herzog was his last name. He was a gunnery sergeant, and he told told me a lot about what and he was decorated, got val yeah. valorous medals for um, Korea, Vietnam, and and World War Two. You know, he got blown up. His he was in an EOD uh, unit. And uh, everybody in his squad was killed but him, and wow. he, he was wounded. Um, but while we were going through the churn of the publishing cycle, um, and, and we have at one point, we had up to 200 authors that we were working with. Um, we're so small that it just slows everything down. So unfortunately, he, he passed away this past fall, and um, his his grand, he she still wants to publish the book, um, so we're going to do that. You know, if if nothing else, we'll we'll definitely get him in a there I was and tell his his wonderful stories. And he had a wonderful life after that. After the military, he was a sea boat captain. Had like three ships go down under him. Not that he was a bad captain, but uh, yeah. you know, events. And then we, like you mentioned, it's not just. Um, uh, war story or we were talking about it. it's not just war stories like people write novels they write science fiction and it's mm -hmm. an outlet for a veteran author to maybe deal with some stuff through writing i know that helps me I, i'm i'm anxious to write myself again uh i kind of miss it because we're all so busy with trying to get other folks books out there uh, so we've taken on some more folks um to try to help with that with the editing and yeah. it is, um, it's one of those things where, you know, we don't make any money. It's, uh, nobody, the, the folks who do the, the work get piecework paid. Like, uh, they create a cover, they do editing, they do formatting, things like that. Then, uh, we pay them for, for that effort, but right. nobody who works with us gets a salary. We don't get a nickel. It's all the payback is in seeing a finished product and the satisfaction uh, in the veteran's face that that his uh, work is now it's in the Library of Congress. It's a uh, an ISBN forever. You know, it, it it is a book, and it is you know done. You know, and the good thing is that I think you know, thankfully, um, in our short uh, conversation we had, uh, stories like these would be perfect for there I was and for sure you know, we, yep. we, we would, uh, mutually will mutually support. I think it's a great way to bring attention to the company and the, the whole thing about rising tides raise all ships. Um, you know, it's what we've been striving for with the company, trying to get some notoriety so that folks say, Oh, a one five publishing. And then maybe it's not so much about the individual book, but it's about supporting the concept so, so that we can get the recognition of veteran authorship and the veteran stories so that it you know we we are a, you know, some people will deny this but america is a martial uh country we fight you know we go to war and you know sometimes reluctantly um but when we do we're we're all in and yeah. it it creates situations that that are they're so dramatic that uh you know talk about life um, there's nothing more dramatic than combat and, sure. um, you know, for folks to live through that and, and be, uh, remain a, a good and kind person and which, which, uh, 99.99% are, um, right. they're, they're just different. They're shaped by it. So that's what we want to capture and, and share with the world is, is, uh, and it's, you know, if, 
if we could, I've, I've tried to expand uh, internationally. Our books sell internationally, but I would like to get some folks from other services to, to uh, I engage with uh, England uh, to get the Brits uh, since I had combat relationships with them, you right. know, see, see what they think. And it would be interesting. Um, you know, Schropp actually had a neighbor who was in the Wehrmacht, Wehrmacht from World War II, and he was an infantry guy. And uh, he just, I think the guy kind of uh, uh, kind of went downhill faster than he could engage with him. Oh, so, okay. but that would have been interesting to get that kind of a story for a, like yeah, a different Vera perspective. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And just listening to some of the stories uh, that I've, you know, now, whenever I go cut the grass or, or do anything, I put your podcast on and, and I listen to, um, you know, I, I would not include myself, but uh, Tac B heroes. And it's just, uh, fascinating. I I laugh. I reminisce. And, yeah, they're amazing. Yeah, and just amazing, um, amazing. uh, you know, it's it's just it's awesome. And the yeah. one thing you know, I, I'm going to kind of go way off the topic here, but one thing I really wanted to mention was uh, well, two things is because I don't want to forget is I I really do appreciate that what you're doing because you really caught my attention with this, and it is noble that that it's it's, i figure it's the digital version of what we're doing um and it's targeted you know on our community which is wonderful because it's needed like right now and uh the other thing i wanted to say well okay three things (laughs) so the other thing was you're you're very good at it and i think that's what attracts people to the site and wanting to do it because you're again you're you're very talented at at uh, emceeing this kind of a conversation and I appreciate you, it. Yeah. You, you let people go and, and you know, when to jump in and, you know, people are interested in what you have to say too. So that that's, you know, again, a, a big part of it. Uh, and the third thing uh, that I wanted to say, like almost first was that I think the thing that I was uh, really fascinated about the military was humor. Uh, the fact that we could make anything funny or, you know, we make fun of each other. We make fun of the situation and we can laugh in the face of death, you know, in some cases, and it's not morbid, you know, it's, it's just necessary. I think yeah. that you have to have the humor. Otherwise you'll just grind yourself to a pulp. Uh, For sure. Know. I agree. I, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. The, the guys, Matter of fact, every episode I think has had a, just a, an abundance of the humor in it. I mean, the humor is what gets us everybody through, and you know, it gets us to where we can kind of put it in the you know take the the drama out of it, take the 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 horror out of it, and just kind of look at the good stuff and kind of get through it. But because it's a necessary evil, you know, when once we're there, once guys like us get on the on the field of battle, it's necessary for us to win. So, you know, we got to do something to get us through it. So, and, and I think our humor. Um... Uh, I guess across the the community, if if you are that kind of person where you can put things in perspective and and you know take it all with a grain of salt, I think that humor is what's going to save us all. Is that for sure? Because if all we did was get get upset about everything all the time, no matter what, then that's all you would be is again you just grind yourself into an unhappy pulp instead right. of you know, just like shucking it off, you know, I, I, ah, geez, I screwed up, you know, now there's times of course to be uh, dead serious, but for sure it's not every day in a, in a uh, situation. So I, I, I always felt that, <clears throat> you know, that as, as joint, I thought, found it in the aviation community, you know, we're just, maybe it's us as Americans, you know, that maybe yeah. we just have a better <laughs> sense of humor than maybe. anybody else. I mean, the Brits laugh at, Benny Hill and guys in clothes and stuff. So on. yeah, I I think it might be just a military thing. I might it might be like an inherent kind of a military characteristic that you you are exposed to such all this bad stuff that you're like, what are you gonna do? Like you said, you just you can't let it get you down. Well, um, I really want to talk about. I don't I don't want to get off here without talking about your your situation. Um, do you is, how I don't, you can go into it as much as you want to, or we don't have to talk about it at all if you if you don't think it'll help people. But um, you know, I think it's important 
to hear kind of your journey through that. You know what I mean? Like what, like how you're doing and um, your treatments that you're, you know, the, the kind of the alternative treatments that you're going through. Um, do you want to, again, however you want to do it is fine by me. No, I'd I love wanna... to. I, okay. I, um, I think uh, the, I feel compelled to because I've discovered some things that I think would be um, helpful for people that are facing uh, cancer. Um, and if maybe there's nobody out there that has not been affected by it. And uh, some folks, even if you're fa like your family member and you want to help, um, I will tell you, I knew zero about it. Uh, I had no, um, I, I never did any research. I never thought twice about cancer until I got it. And, and then I, I'm a, I'm a practical, rational person. And some of the, uh, what was being presented to me was irrational and impractical. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I was going to lose capability to get rid of something that may or may not kill me, you know, et cetera. So what happened was uh, in my uh, no kidding retirement physical, so 30 years, get through all of that, and then it's time to move on and start relaxing and having fun. Um, they find some numbers that that indicate that, you know, I need to get checked. So looks like possibility there. So I kept pushing it off. And so first kind of indication that, that it was a little bit off illogical was um, the doctor said, called me, I was at a job interview and um, I just finished and the doc said, hey, look, you got to go get a biopsy because um, these numbers show that you probably have cancer. And I said, well, what if I don't? And then she said, well, you're going to die. And I said, when? And she said, I can't tell you. And I said, well, then, you know, that's information. If you can't tell me when I'm going to die, then is it urgent? Is it going to? And it turns out I had the most aggressive strain of this particular cancer. Um, but um, I still have it. I'm still here and I've been doing different things. So what happened was I, I uh, had surgery and the cancer came right back. And, uh, so that's when I started thinking like, I cannot keep going this route and the standard of care requires a, a sequential order of treatment. So typically it would be like, um, either chemo radiation and then, or surgery probably first then chemo radiation. So we all have heard all of this before mm -hmm. and, um, you know, surgery is cutting something out. Uh, chemo is poisoning and radiation is burning. So those are damaging, uh, treatments. So, sure. uh, so it, I really broadened my, uh, research and thoughts on it. And I started looking at about, okay, what caused the cancer? And that's something that no doctor has ever looked into. Not one ever has asked me what you do for a living where have you served you know what what do you eat what do you drink do you work out the, because the system i believe has become uh full of procedurists so if you're a radiation guy you do radiation this is a solution to the world's problems if you're a, a medical oncologist it's chemo and if you're a surgeon it's surgery uh, so if that's the case then you're not getting a holistic view. So that's what drove me to, to holistic medicine. And uh, now conventional medicine, traditional medicine is wonderful and it's advancing. And I'm not saying that it's bad, but uh, my whole pitch, and this is, this is actually something I would assert to everybody is try alternative first, because you never know, there might be uh, a pattern in your life that if you change, then stress, which is a cause, a cause of cancer, 
could be relieved and you could uh, change everything. Um, diet, uh, for instance, here's a great example. Uh, probably the easiest cancer to identify and, and uh, treat yourself holistically is one you've caused yourself, which is say, for instance, you smoke, you know, stop smoking, yeah. watch yeah. what happens. You know, your body will heal itself. It will try, it will try, you know, now sometimes, you know, the cancer gets going and, and you have to do other things, but uh, so there's a whole bunch of people out there that have um, I, I would call it medically gone off the grid and they write a lot about what they do. They, they share it. Uh, I'm, I'm of the mind of sharing it, not monetizing it. So I want to write a book and I want to send it to everybody um, because of the things that I've discovered in the time that I've had cancer. If I knew a lot of this stuff beforehand, then who knows? Um, right. You know, so uh, like I was alluding to before we started, um, things that I do are simple. They're food, their uh, state of mind, like meditation, uh, their exercise, uh, certain types of exercise, um, and, um, supplements. So for instance, like I was told years ago that I had a vitamin D deficiency. So I started taking vitamin D with calcium and then I kind of forgot, you know, I forgot about it and, um, I stopped taking it. I stopped thinking about it. And so one of the first things a holistic doctor told me to do when I'm fighting cancer is take vitamin D and mm -hmm. D three. So in my mind, I think to myself, I wonder if I could have prevented this by maintaining a level of vitamin D and I, maybe I wouldn't be dealing with cancer now. So now I have three cancers. And, uh, so I, I asked doctors, I go, how does like, I'm a, I'm a healthy guy. I just happen to have three cancers, you know, it's like, how does a guy that, that, that is me end up with three cancers and none of them can answer that question. Now the holistic doctors, they, they can, or they at least, uh, posit what they think it might be by doing analysis of, of you as a person. And then, um, having you try these different things and see how you react to it. Um, myself, I have tried some things that if I had talked to myself before I knew all of what I know, I would have laughed in my face. Um, mm -hmm. but I've gone down, um, almost every alternative road and it all, here's the thing. It all works. It all works to a degree. And so good things do good things to you. So it's whether or not you can beat it. And what happens is cancer, and I'm going to put human characteristics to it, but it's smart and there are pathways that feed cancer. So the idea is to block the pathways that your cancer is using to feed itself and grow. If you do, it can shift to another pathway. So you have to try to knock them all out and that that's difficult. It's doable with one cancer with three, it's hard. I mean, it, because yeah. I, I don't know which one is. And, uh, speaking of which, um, somebody's probably thinking, well, you can't starve to, to death and, and then you would cure the cancer, but you can fast and fasting is a, uh, amazing tool. I, I, I did it just to do it. Like I, yeah. when I was younger, I did it, you know, for, I don't know, discipline sometimes to lose weight. Uh, but doing it medically is a fascinating thing. And you think you're hungry, you're hungry, you know, maybe two, three days after day three, you're not hungry anymore. And you start feeling like a million bucks. And it's the same thing your dog does when it gets sick. It curls up in a corner, may drink a little bit of water, but it's diverting all of its resources to its immune system. And that's what you're doing when you're, re you're fasting is you're re resetting your immune system. Okay. So, uh, there's so much to share. Um, I just wanted to, I'll throw that out there as an introduction, but my theory is that, that, uh, JD, if you, if I said, um, like for instance, there's a, 
a protocol and it's called the Budwig, Bud, Budwig Protocol. And I'll tell you a quick uh, summary of it. Uh, Joanna Budwig was a PhD German uh, biochemist uh, in the 50s. And she determined that through the industrialization of food, our food is not as good as it used to be. So when you eat it, it's difficult for it to get to the cellular level and it doesn't have as much nutrition as it used to. So she developed a recipe and it's, it's the Budwick protocol and use uh, cottage cheese, which is sulfur based. Uh, and that allows the permeation of cells. So this is the break into the cell level, uh, flaxseed and flaxseed oil. You ground it up, you mix it up in an emulsifier and does this concoction. I eat it every morning. And um, now I say that I've, I've taken a breaks several times sure. because the, my cancer is, is uh, it's susceptible to increase with dairy. So I don't eat dairy except for that. But I do realize that um, her pitch was that it doesn't act like dairy when you mix it all up. You put um, turmeric in it and uh, black pepper. If you ever take turmeric, always use black pepper because it makes it more bioavailable. But anyway, the point is that um, her cure rate for cancers, including stage four, was 90%. She had a wow. clinic. It was fascinating. So the pharmaceutical company approached her and they wanted to patent it. And she said, absolutely not, because she wants people like me to be able to go to the grocery store, buy the stuff, mix it and eat it and save your own life potentially. That's, yeah. it sounds like oversimplification, but y you know, if you think about it, um, what is, and then name it, surgery, uh, chemo, radiation. It, it's a very uh, harmful, but very simple concept is cancer is weak. It, it, that's why it, anything that grows fast cells that grow fast is weak because it, it's replicating so fast. That's why you lose your hair when you do um, chemo because that your hair is the fastest growing cells in your body. Okay. You know, so uh, it, the hard part is killing it and not killing you. That's sure. why food, um, some supplements. And so when I talked about the pathways and I'll, I'll take a, a breath here, I promise, but I'm very no, passionate no, about fine. this. this is no, this is fascinating. So the the pathway thing was uh, put out by um, a lady named Jane McClellan. She's a, a Brit, and she was a like a physician's assistant. She wasn't a doctor, but she got cancer, and she started asking the questions. And the doctors had answers she wasn't satisfied with, so she started doing research. So she developed what she calls, because of the British term for subway, a metro. She calls it the metro map. So you can look up your cancer and see the, the pathways that that cancer uses, protein, fat, uh, sugar, big one, sugar um, yeah. feeds cancer. That's why they give you glucose when they do your scan, is the, the uh, cancer sucks up the sugar and they can see that in the scan. But anyway, she, so from the pathway blockage, she identified with the help of uh, pharmacists, some uh, medications that are benign that have by coincidence, uh, anti-cancer properties. So they call it the Care Oncology Clinic. And so I, I prescribe to them and I get a uh, medication that is, is like, you could take it for the rest of your life with no ill effects, except for the statin. I'm leery of statins. So I'm taking the absolute minimum of that. That's a Simba statin. Uh, metformin is an anti-diabetes drug. It's very benign. Uh, doxycycline is an antibiotic. And met, uh, mebendazole is an anti, it's a deworming medication. So get this, it, you know, the thing used to cost, they sell it in the, gro used to sell it in the phar pharmacy or the grocery store. And the pills were little tablets and they were $4 a piece about. And um, a story came out how mebendazole can fight cancer. And I went to get my prescription renewed 
$16,000 copay for, for a, a absolutely teeny little benign pill that gets rid of worms and kids. And they're charging that kind of money for it. And it just makes you more convinced that there's got to be a better way. So, sure. uh, and I'd be happy, um, you know, I, I don't know if there's a, um, people have reached out to me. I'm, what I'm offering is I'd be happy to help people kind of navigate the initial part of it, you, you know, because I, I feel um, conscious of the fact that I am not an expert, but I am living it, you know, and I am concerned about my own life. So, you know, I, I would help somebody kind of get on the path and maybe find the first step and you know, some folks have come to me with loved ones that ha that have cancer, their parents or something, and they're they're just they just want to get rid of it. So they just yeah. to just say, okay, let's just go to the doc and do the thing. Well, if you're if you're seventy five or older, okay, maybe that you know if, if it doesn't kill you and it cures the cancer, good on you. But sure. if you're fifty or you're forty five, and you're gonna have a um, a lingering or, or, or forever side effect. Um, for, for me in particular, like I, I have, um, what they call head and neck cancer. I have uh, parotid cancer and throat cancer and lymph nodes involved so that they want to shoot my head full of radiation to kill it. Well, that would, uh, destroy my salivary glands. I'd always have to have a glass or bottle of water. Um, and it, and then it affects your teeth because your saliva so I don't want to do that. And, right. you know, I'm, I'll, I'll say I'm fine. I mean, I, I feel fine. I feel absolutely fine. And I've been doing this now for eight years. And like I said, I had one of the most aggressive, deadliest cancers. And, uh, they told me I had one to three to live for, for this. And, um, it's year six. Wow. So, um, I'd, again, happy to help. And yeah, I mean, would you, um, I could put your email address in the show notes or I could, I mean, how do you, or somebody, if anybody's listening to this and they, and just shoot me a message and I can get you in touch with, um, with Pete or any, whatever you guys want. I mean, however you want to do it. I, I, I'm a, I love this kind of thing because I think that, um, and not to go down this road too far, but I think people are in the pharmaceutical companies are in it for the money. And like you were just alluding to with that, with that medication, I think the more we can, you know, talk to guys like you and get your inputs and your no kidding anecdotal information on how th the different methods of treating these kind of things. Uh, I think, I think we're going to be better off I, for sure. So, and, yeah, and I'd love to, I'd love to, for people to reach out to you if they could. Absolutely. hundred percent. And, and, uh, I I'll go back to using a military approach. Uh, I think, especially if, if a lot of our, uh, your audience, um, uh, is military and you think of it, uh, in those terms, it, it kind of starts to make more sense. You know, what's the, the, the most lethal threat, you know, that's the thing you need to be worried about most, you know, like what's going to kill you, uh, what will disable you, what will, um, uh, maybe be temporary, you, you know, and then, um, I, I think, like I said, you're a healthy man. And, and I would say uh, if you would start doing some of these protocols on a recurring basis, maybe quarterly or something. And what you're doing is you're keeping the, the landing craft off the beach. You know, you're taking them out before they get there. You don't want them colonizing. And that's what the whole right. idea of the, um, the protocol I mentioned is, is to, okay, you got cancer. Um, your body might be able to kill it. Let's keep it from propagating. Let's keep sure. it from metastasizing, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And I'd be happy to give you, you know, I'd certainly give you uh, as a friend uh, update. I'm getting a scan uh, coming up and it's uh, some newfangled thing and it'll kind of, it, it's good feedback to tell me how I'm doing. And, and that's yeah, another yeah. thing is, you know, that uh, that's where your, your conventional doctor can come into play is, you get somebody who's got an open mind and they become your teammate. Um, what you need, what everybody needs, which I did not have is a quarterback, uh, I'm mixing metaphors here, but um, <laughs> you know, a quarterback to go, okay, so here's what we're going to do and then help you, you know, here's now don't do that one, do this, or, 
you know, here's the, here's a number for this guy or something like that. Maybe not to that level of detail, but somebody to guide you with experience to, to get to a certain place that, that uh, you can take from here. And the, ultimately the thing I want to remind everybody is that uh, you're in charge, not the doctor. And don't ever feel timid about saying no, thanks or nope. No, you know, most people will go, okay, doc, sounds pretty bad, but okay, doc, you know, let's, yeah. let's do it. Um, and I had a buddy, I just two, you know, quick stories. Everybody's got cancer stories, but, um, this one is, is very relevant to this conversation. He was on my team, this team that I'm on now and, uh, Marine, um, tough as nails. Uh, he was a Marine aviator and, um, when he got cancer, he got multiple cancers. He told the doctor, give, give me all you got. Give me the max, max dosage, max power. And he did it. And it was devastating to him. He was, uh, he was beaten up. He looked like he was a hundred years old, but they got the cancer yeah. and, uh, he died from, he had no cancer anymore, but he died from, uh, his immune system was shot his, his body was shot, um, because he had just been beaten down. So you can kill cancer, but again, it's the not killing the, the individual. And right before he died, he called me and he said, I want, I, I, he said, I don't have cancer anymore, but he goes, I want to help you in what you're doing because he saw the, the difference and, and the, the benefit of it, you know? So again, I, don't jump to a decision. The doctor will tell you, you have to make this decision fast. Uh, and you, could be true, could be absolutely 100% true. I've seen right. people that find out and they're dead within two days because of when they find it. It's just too yeah. advanced. And and there are cases where it's too, it's too late, you know, but um, I would say it's almost never too late you know, to where there's something you can do that's that maybe you have to go more extreme. Um, but um, there is hope out there that is not a surrender. You know, don't yeah. don't surrender. It seems like um, kind of like you were saying, like you need a, you need somebody you need all aspects. Holistic is the way to go. I mean, even if even if you do maybe a little bit of chemo or, or something, but that doesn't mean you can't do other stuff as well. Or, you know, I mean, and and if like. <clears throat> I mean, it's, it's very unfortunate to hear about your friend, but <clears throat> maybe if he had been doing the things you're doing now and that other stuff, he could have built up some sort of immune. I don't, I don't know, but I think I, I, I just feel for you. And I, I hope I really, I'm, it's, it's very encouraging to hear that all that stuff's working for you. I mean, it, it, I'm, I'm glad that, um, you know, that you're able to stave it off. I mean, I think that's great. And I, I, I definitely want to hear you know, how those scans go and, you know, just on a personal level, you know, like how you're, how you're doing. And, and if I can do anything for you, if I can, you know, whatever, whatever you're, you need, just, you know, let me know. Or if you need me to, I definitely want to disseminate this information for sure. But no, if, I, you know, yeah, I appreciate it very much. And, yeah. and uh, thanks for your kindness. And I would say to, to be a hundred percent honest, um, there has been a gradual um, advance but it has been like compared to what uh, I was told and what I would have probably experienced, I would have been absolutely uh, um, degraded my immune system and my physical being by going through the treatment for three separate cancers, you know, um, and, and, you know, I probably wouldn't, I would say I probably wouldn't be here today. Now, again, I want to say, that I do believe in modern medicine. It saved my life a couple of times um, through other things, but in this mm -hmm. cancer realm, like, like I said, and, and I, I really do appreciate your words um, that think, think, don't surrender, don't just give up and go with it. You know, that's not the thing to do here. It is to stop and go, okay, start looking stuff up. And if you're not that kind of person, um, that's what we have, uh, grandkids for and, and kids okay. and friends that, that, uh, they want to help. They love you and they want to help. So, so let them, let them help. Yep. And, uh, you know, it's amazing. There are some anecdotal stories about, uh, folks going from, uh, um, the stage four to, um, to, um, cured 
in months yeah you know so um i think the uh possibilities are out there and they're the thing okay so here's just one more point is sure sure that uh the prolongation is a is a success it's a victory because they are making advances um rapidly and uh you know, I, I I don't know much about it, but I have I have messed with a little bit in the publishing company, the AI stuff. If they could put all of that into an engine like that, um, the the records, the history of the, um, maybe in an untreated way and then certain treatments, maybe they can crack the nut because I don't think there's enough communication. So what you're trying to do is if you can't cure it outright, you're just trying to stay alive long enough before uh or until until they find a solution you know sure. uh, and that's coming it's coming yeah. i have no doubt in my mind cancer will be uh maybe hundreds of years from now but it'll be thing of the ancients that that yeah. uh, no longer exists and and um just be uh good to your body and and it'll be if you do something and it it's aggravating stop doing it <laughs> Right. <laughs> you know, honestly, because <laughs> it, yeah. it really is either to your body, like if you wear shoes that rub and you, you like your high heels or something and take them off because it, it wear flats or do do something because con consistent inflammation, aggravation could lead to cancer. And that it goes emotionally, too. You know, if you're in a situation where you're frustrated all the time, you hate your job, you know, you're in a sh bad relationship, um, you know you can stay in a relationship and then be dead in five years or maybe you get out and you find a better one you know yeah. and I'm not, I'm not saying that lightly it's it's a thing you know just stress and all that no it's a good point i mean a lot mental health is, is just as important as it, it it can manifest physical problems in your body you know if you have poor mental health so that's that's a good point well sir i this has been awesome I, this I can't thank you enough for coming on here. I mean, I just the stories and then hearing your, your, what you're going through and in, in your um, technique to get past this uh, is inspiring, frankly. So I, I just want to say thanks. And, um, and again, I want to keep in touch with you and then let's try to figure out how to, um, to help your book. If you, whatever you need to do, just let me know, you know, if we, we need to, um, uh, you know, transcribe it or however you want to do it. Um, I'm on board. I think it's a good idea. And I, I think it's a good way to just to get, because the whole point of this, kind of like you alluded to, was just to get these stories out there. I mean, these, there are so many, so many good stories and so many heroes in our career field, in our, in our sphere of influence that people just don't know about. And I, I just kind of want to get them out there and get these guys the recognition they deserve. Yeah. And you're doing, you're doing great at it. And, um, uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, it was an honor to oh, of course. be able to speak on, on all of these things. It's, uh, something you, you got rolling around in your head and, uh, to be able to talk about it. And I guess one of the realizations I have is, is that, uh, I said so much, but I missed so much, <laughs> you know, there was so, so many details. That's why in some cases, uh, you know, books are, are great because they're, they allow for the, the gradual digesting of the thoughts and, and the, you know, like the, this, the history of, of what we we're talking about. And I think you're doing a great service to the community and capturing a lot of the stories of our, our, uh, warriors and, um, the conflicts because it's lessons learned too for the future. And Definitely. it's also an examination of, uh, the human, you know, kind of at war, uh, I mm -hmm. think is an interesting aspect of it. And, uh, again, like I said before, uh, you're a great moderator and, um, I appreciate you giving me and, and all of us the time to, you know, a lot of time to, to talk about, of course. So, and maybe we sure. do a, um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll think about, um, what else that I could provide in a maybe separate episode about the cancer part, you know, cause definitely, I was just going to say that I just, I mean, I, everyone's invited to come on as many times as they want. And if they have more stories or if they, like you said, if you have more information, I would love to have you back on and maybe if things, you know, kind of see your progress or things that you forgot to bring up, I would love to re readdress all that stuff. Cause I like, yeah, the other stuff was 
great to hear, but this is like important stuff that people could act, can really use to they have cancer if they have something that they need to, to get past. I mean, I think it's pretty important. So yeah, for sure. I'd love to read, I'd love to link back up someday and um, in the near future and kind of see how things are going and see if you got any new techniques or, you know, all any of that stuff. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll sure. keep in touch with you. You know, we'll email back and forth and, and, uh, okay. and then, you know, we'll, we'll uh, take the next step towards our, our, uh, business relationship, I think, uh, with the stories and, uh, I'm trying to find out the best way to transcribe all of it. Well, okay. thanks again. And I'll, I'll let you go. And, and, um, I, uh, look forward to future relationship and, and, um, um, uh, collaboration. Same here, sir. All right. Thanks a lot. Yeah. I appreciate it. Yep. Same okay. here. Take care. Hey!